IB Nation, what's going on? Welcome to the Irish Breakdown Podcast. A little bit of a Saturday edition because we just had some access to Notre Dame spring practice. It's been a busy couple of days, Brian, for you especially over, over the last two, man. You went to the Pro Day yesterday. You had the spring practice availability today. We had Brian on tap today in at the spring practice. We had Vince that was in attendance, and Sean Davis was also in attendance at this practice today. A lot we want to talk about, and you know, we really kind of want to dive into it. I'm Ryan Roberts, Director of Recruiting here at Irish Breakdown. That, of course, is Brian Driscoll, the publisher here at IrishBreakdown.com. Brian, it sounds like it was a uh, another – I'll say it like this, right? I see a lot of young names on this list of key players that you really want to talk about. It seems so far, man, that some of these young cats that we're really excited about coming in to spring practice – they're showing out and they're impressive a little bit, man. But, you know, just I guess to get us kicked off here, what are just some of your main takeaways from today before we get into individual players? Well, just to let people know, obviously today it was one of those things where, you know, we didn't get a chance to see a lot of practice. Again, it's five periods. Uh, two of those periods were special teams periods, so we didn't get a chance to see a ton of that. And then I was going to watch a lot of the defense today, but the defense just spent the whole time working on individual drills. So that's a twofold thing. Number one is it's bad for me and for y'all because we didn't get to see them running around and doing as much activity as the offense did, for example. So that's the bummer for the practice report. The positive is, is looking at the football team, they spent a lot of time working on individual. That's yes. why they weren't doing a whole lot. So it may stink for us. But it was good. It's good for the team because, like I said, they were doing a lot of stuff that was uh, focused on individual drills and things like that. And I would say this to everybody out there if you are not locked into boards at irishbreakdown.com, I would really much recommend it because Brian puts on every single day, he puts on when he has these practice availabilities, the first people that know about it or the subscribers to Irish Breakdown. So every single day, only a few minutes before we start the show, Brian put up his practice observation and a little bit of a recap for today. So we're going to kind of work through that. But for the people that are on the message board, Brian, they've already seen a bunch of these notes, right? So it really pays to be a part of the board because we also know this is a big recruiting weekend for Notre Dame. So I'm, I'll have plenty of intel this weekend. Me and Sean Davis will have plenty of intel about what we're hearing, you know, kind of visit recaps and, you know, just kind of some general vibes around the recruiting weekend. But of course, spring practice, is what everybody's here to talk about and what I'm excited to talk about. We'll also do a mailbag at the end. I forgot to mention that at the beginning. So if you want to throw some mailbag questions into the chat, just throw an MB before hand so we can kind of distinguish between questions and just general commentary in the chat. But Brian, I know that we talked a lot about the offensive side of the football because that's where you were, your eyes were most you know, fixated to on the first day, You know, watching the quarterbacks, the wide receivers, the tight ends specifically. Today, like you said, you try, you did try to get more eyes, obviously, on the defensive side of the football. Sounds like there were three young linebackers that really caught your attention. Right. I want to start with Nolan Ziegler because he was a guy that we have been talking about for months, a guy that you have been I very I thought we talked about him a lot for months, but apparently yesterday we don't hear, they don't hear enough about him. So, But I, I kid with Paul. But, yeah, he uh, – yeah. yeah, sorry. I just had to say no. that. <laughs> no, like, no, you're fine. We talked a lot about him. I know, I know, I know. That, that was a funny comment the other day because I'm like, I feel like we talk about Nolan as, as, as yeah. often as we possibly can, right? Yeah. But you talked about him today in your practice report, a young man that we're both excited about. We think that if it's an open competition, he will have a chance to play a lot in yeah. 2023. But what did you see today from Nolan that got you so excited? Well, it's it's a couple things, Ryan. Number one is he's the biggest linebacker they have. I mean, it's it's obvious. He's taller than everybody else they have. He's thicker than everybody else they have. That's obviously a good sign, but he's also arguably their most explosive linebacker. It's him and it's him and Jalen Sneed, just pure explosiveness. And when you look at him and, and you see a guy that's 6'3, he's over 230 pounds. Now he, he was listed at 225 on the roster. I can assure you he's bigger than that. He was over 230 when he came back from spring break, I've been told. So he's over 230 pounds, but he moves like the smaller guys. I mean, he's very smooth, very fluid. But also really twitchy, Ryan. You know, he'll he'll look real smooth going to Latin, and then bam, he'll plant and just explode downhill. It's really impressive, man. And and you watch him play, and you're like, 
look, because like we know he's instinctive. We know he's got the football IQ. He showed that in high school. You know, we'll see if we'll see if he does if he shows it. Obviously, we'll find out on April first and then the blue gold game if he's able to kind of turn that into you know turn that into consistent great play. You know, we'll find that out. But you know, Ryan, athletically and size, strength wise, he's everything you look for. I mean, he he yeah. is legit. You know, we ranked him a lot higher than a lot of other people did coming out of high school. And, you know, you, you take a risk when you rank guys differently than everybody else. Sure. And so far, I mean, athletically, it's like, yeah, that's exactly why we ranked him where we ranked him. Is that right there? Because the athleticism that that kid possesses is really, really impressive. It, it is. And, you know, that long, thick, and athletic, that's kind of what you want in a linebacker, right, Ryan? I mean, that's kind of yeah. – that's kind of that's, what the need is at this point in time. So, if he gets a if he gets a legitimate shot at, at the will linebacker position, I, I think he's going to have a chance to 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 have that job. I really do. Well, and he's a player too, Brian. And, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I know he played obviously in high school. He played all over the place. He played a wide receiver. He played as kind of an overhang position a ton out in space. But he's a very instinctual player, if I remember kind of your evaluation of him coming out of yes. high school. So just kind of checks a lot of boxes, man. Like there's not really anything that he's missing at the linebacker position, it seems. No, he's not. Just experience, you know. And again, he didn't play inside right. in high school. He was primarily a rover in high school. So that that's going to require some changes. You know, like one thing I don't know if he can do yet because we haven't seen it in practice. And that's why I'm really looking forward to seeing that open practice where we get to see a scrimmage and then the blue gold game. You know, how is he with block destruction? You know, sure. saw some clips from, you know, some different things last year. And you say, you know, the, the boy, young guy really runs around well, but how does he handle the the finer points of the game? Getting Taking on blocks, getting off blocks, you know, using his hands to get by uh, attempted blockers, you know, playing with the discipline. Those things we got to see, right? Yeah. But athletically, it's, it's impressive. It's a really yeah. impressive thing. And I, that's why I say I feel like, from what I've heard from other sources the, about how he played last year, he's a pretty instinctive kid, and he was very disruptive on the scout team when when they were allowed to let him roll, let him run and stuff. So, um, you know, he, he's an impressive looking. I mean, look, that's the thing, Ryan. You watch this group, and you're like, yeah, the athletically, the the talent they've recruited in the last two years is legit. Yep. I mean, the two most explosive athletes they have are Nolan and Jalen Sneed, who again played with a ton of you know just mo not playing moving around with a lot of confidence today, you know, during special teams, Joe, he's flying all over the field, you know, showing speed and, and playing fast. And, you know, you can obviously, you know, you can see him just putting in the work, you know, and, and um, that's a positive, at least putting in the, the effort, I should say, which is a positive. And yeah. then you watch Jaden Osbury and you're like, man, this is the smoothest linebacker that they have, you know? And, and so th this is what you hoped you'd see. And, and again, this is drills, just going through drills. We haven't seen any team stuff yet. But man, I um, I, I'm very pleased and impressed with what we've seen so far from that group. Yeah, and and I, I like that you mentioned Osbury and Snead a little bit already, Brian, because I know that you had a big note on both of those guys. Because I mean, work. I mean, from a sounds of it, it sounds like Jaden Osbury might get some looks at Rover early on. I, I don't know yeah, if you can really. So. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah. I don't. I know. I know we, it's kind of tough to distinguish. We in don't these know types that from what we've seen so far, right? Yeah. But that's what I've been told. He's going to get work at Rover, but. What we saw today was just guys going through drills. We didn't see the defense sure. lined up at all, really. A um, little bit. The secondary did lined up at some things. They were working on like mesh routes and things like that. Because what they were working on is they're working on like perimeter screens and like you know not like mesh routes. I but it's like they were like blocking down and working out slides. You know, just a lot of perimeter passes working on block destruction with the yeah. DBs, which was good to see. But uh, you know, nothing with the linebackers or D line where we had any idea of where guys were lining up. We, we didn't sure. get a chance to see that. And we won't get a chance to see that till April 1st at this point. Yep. Just like, and, not that far away. That that rover position is one that I'm so intrigued about, though, Brian. I mean, you know, you have Jack Kaiser coming back who, you know, has been the mainstay at the rover position the last two years. But, you know, you're talking about these couple young rovers, man, with Jaden Sneed, you know, adding the weight and it sounds like he's maintained that explosiveness. And then Jaden Osbury also adding some good weight to Saucy's. I mean, he was listed at – 215 pounds in the updated roster. So, I mean, I'm, I'm so he excited, looks a little man. bigger than that, though. He doesn't look Does he? like a skinny – like Jalen Sneed looks 250 pounds. Jaden Osbury looks thicker than Jalen Sneed, even though they're listed at basically the same weight. Just different body types. Sure. Just different body types. But, man, you know, and Vince is in the chat. I mean, he, he'll tell you. The, the linebackers 
because again, what have we always said about the starters, Ryan? They can move. They're athletic. Yes. And then you watch these young guys, and you're just like, gosh, dog, there's no excuse for this linebacking core not to be better because these guys can move. This is an athletic yes. group of guys, and that was impressive to see. Perfect illustration. We talk about the the. I think that there's a there's a little bit of a misnomer about the starting linebackers. To your point, is like they're not athletic. No, they're athletic. It's just that some of the guys that are coming up behind them are like super athletic, right? Like there's yeah. just different different level of athleticism, and I think that you have to be impressed by guys like Osbury, especially Osbury. I mean, you should have expected, right? Because Osbury was a very instinctual player too. So I'm not surprised that he's coming in and just, you know, kind of looking the part early, which is great to see. Jalen Sneed, you expect obviously a big year. Let me ask a question about linebacker coaching, Brian, before we move on to the defensive line. This is a player that I know you're excited to talk about. One note that Sean Davis told me over the phone earlier was he – was really optimistic about seeing Max Bulla kind of coach one-on-one a little bit today because he said that he was very vocal and he had a little bit of fire to him. I don't know if you saw a little bit of the same yeah, things did. or if there's any observations yeah. there. No, he was. He was very loud and active. You could hear him. And they were on the other side of the practice field too. Sean compared it to last year, how he never heard James Laronitis really coaching. He he could see yeah. him coaching, but he didn't hear him coaching. Max has just got a louder presence. Apparently I can't speak to that because I didn't, I wasn't at practices last year, so I can't speak to that personally, right. but no, he's loud. I mean, you hear Jared Parker, Gino Godouli's very active. You know, I don't know what he's saying, but Al Washington has been very active, engaged in practices so far. And, and we'll, we'll talk about the D line here in a minute. There's not a lot to tell from the D line from what we can see other yep. than just guys moving around. You know, and some of us like, okay, hey, Jordan, but that was really quick. Okay, shocker. We knew that, right? Oh, Josh <laughs> Burnham's really athletic. Yeah, we already knew that. But, you know, you see Coach Washington, and I don't know who the defensive line GA is. Big guy. I don't know his name. Trying to find that out. But, uh, you know, they were both working. I mean, coaching. I don't know if they, what they were coaching or what they were saying because I couldn't hear him. Coach Washington doesn't have a really booming voice. Yeah. You know, the way that some other coaches do. So I couldn't hear what he was saying. But, I mean, he was working. I mean, he was getting a sweat on coaching the kids up and – it, walking them through things and teaching them things and showing them different aspects of what they're doing, you know, constantly teach. I mean, so that's good, right? You see a guy working yes. and, you know, he didn't get to Michigan and Ohio state and Notre Dame by not knowing football. Right. I mean, sure. so, you know, so you, you, you hope that he's, it's working. And, you know, again, I, I, I'm curious to see how his second year goes without some of the veterans who yep. the reality is, look, when you've got older players and, and a coach left who was successful, it's hard to get that buy-in sometimes. Yep. So it's a little easier now that those guys are gone and you know, you're know you now going into year two. Hopefully it, it's a little bit better for him in that regard. And that means he can get more out of the group. But the one guy that stood out to me, Ryan, is we saw Jason Onye listed at 292 on the depth yeah. chart. And I'm like, okay, that's good in theory. But the question is, okay, but is it good weight? Yeah. Can he still move? I mean, he was like a 240 pound kid when he committed to Notre Dame. And some kids can add 50 pounds and they get more explosive. Other kids add 50 pounds and they get slow. And you you never know how it's going to be. And so my concern when I saw that he is up to over 290 pounds, you're like, man, like, okay, hopefully he can still move. Yep, he can still move. I was really impressed. He doesn't, he, he looks thicker, but it's not bad weight at all. Like I was worried, Ryan, because you know, how sometimes those linemen, they can't gain weight. So they eat a lot and it gets like yes. in their, 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 their thought, not their, not their thighs, but like their, 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 their um, love handle Mid-section. area, their, their yeah. soul, their core, you know, you can tell their, their, their gut, they get a little bit of back fat and you're like, he's just trying to get up to 290 to, to get up to 290. That was yep. not the case with Jason. He just looks thick. He's really filled out. He has incredible arm length. And the thing that I noticed today, watching him work through drills is he, he looks like he understands how to use his hands now, even though, they're, again, they're just going through drills, but it's like the timing with he's stepping and ripping his hands through on different things. Like, okay, he's figuring it out. He's figuring it out, but he's really athletic for his size, Ryan. Like that, that was an encouraging thing. I'm very much looking forward to seeing Jason Onye going through like actual one-on-ones and team run periods and things like that, because if he can move, uh, if he can move in practice the way that he did in drills, I mean, in moving in periods the way he did in drills, you got a 290 pound kid who's twitchy off the line. Yeah. I mean, and here's the thing too: he showed me today just in drills the same first step burst that Jason Adamiola shows us, which was excellent. Yes. The difference is, is 
Jason has a different level of change of direction that we didn't see from that we didn't see from uh, Jason or Adam Miller, which is why he at times struggled to to really uh, make plays. You know, it's because plays. He, just, he could get vertical, yeah. but then he couldn't get off the ball and 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 do those things. You know, sure. Well, and Onye was a person, Brian, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but he missed it, it, most of his senior year, if not all of it, right, due to COVID? Was, wasn't he one of the guys that were seriously impacted that way? Well, he missed his senior year for COVID. Yeah. His state didn't allow football that year. The reason that hurt him more than others is Jason had only been playing football for two years. So right. that third year, because he went to Bishop Hendrickson to play basketball. And so he needed that third year of football to just continue to develop because he was a really raw kid. Now he had like, I think like 17 sacks his junior year. I mean, he just exploded, but you watch him play and you're like, he's bigger and just more athletic than anyone he's playing against. He doesn't have to have any technique to just dominate people, but you love right. the motor, the athleticism, the length. He just didn't know how to play football yet. And now you look at him and you're like, okay, this guy knows how to play football. This, this guy he, he's learning how to play football. He's learning how to just, you know, I mean, again, it's a drill. It's just a drill. But yes. watching him step and shoot his hands and look really comfortable and confident doing it, you're like, okay, that's that's what we're hoping to hear. That's yeah. absolutely and, what we're hoping to hear. And, again, like you said before, it's great on paper, but a, a couple of these defensive linemen, man, there's been a big, you know, and it's not wrong, but, like, there's, you know, been big fan conversations about the size on the interior, and I totally get it, but – now you're looking at it, you're like, Riley Mills is 296 pounds. Jason Onye is 292 pounds. Tyson Ford's 292. Gabriel Rubio's over 300. Quickly, you have starting to get some beef on the interior. You need more of it, obviously, moving forward. But hopeful, obviously, for that room to get developed. Brian, I want to take us to the secondary because there were three cornerbacks that I know you were really impressed with. Uh, no surprise, it starts with Benjamin Morrison, who sounds sure. like he had a really good day. Well, no, he just, I mean, like the thing about Benjamin, the, the point I made in the note was like, of course, Benjamin and Cam look good and Clarence Lewis look good going through drills. Like that's not the shocker, right? Like, yeah, they look good going through drills. The point was simply to say, like, I could sit here and go to every practice and watch the starters and who are, you know, hey, guess what? Joe Walt looked really good today. All right. Okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to look at other guys and see how other guys perform. And so, yeah, those guys look good. But Benjamin, Benjamin's bit from, from talking to some sources, Benjamin's been getting pushed in like yep. team and one-on-ones and stuff like that. Like the receivers are making plays on him and having to make great plays on him. And that's a great thing to hear. Great yes. thing to hear. Cause you want him to be challenged by those guys, but athletically, I mean, he's filled out, you know, he's definitely thicker than he was last year. I mean, that six pounds of difference is you could see it in the upper body. He definitely is filled out there, but uh, he moves around. But I, I was really impressed by really some of the younger corners and it starts with Christian gray, Ryan, he yes. is skinny, skinny, <laughs> but his movements are so e the, the one thing that you love to be able to say about a cornerback is he does things easily. He just moves easily. Benjamin Morrison just moves easily. And that's what I see from Christian Gray. I see a lot of Benjamin Morrison and him and just the way he moves his length. Uh, he's taller it, to me than his 5'11", whatever he's listed as. He looks over yeah. six feet tall to me. Uh, he looks every bit as tall, if not slightly taller than Benjamin Morrison, just looking at it on the field. But his change of direction is really smooth. It's really clean. Uh, he plays with confidence already. They do things or in drills where they're like backpedal and then plant and drive and backpedal, plant and drive. They do like backpedal, open up and flip their hips. They'll do those drills in practice. And he's so smooth doing it. Just pedal, yeah. pedal, pedal, bam, just real clean, easy movement. You know, one time his his – his feet weren't where they needed to be. So he kind of got a little like, you know, mixed up when he transitioned, but every other time it was really clean and that stuff is easy to correct. You know, it's just, he's thinking about it instead of just doing it, you know? Sure. But yep. he, he looks really smooth, really smooth. Uh, when he's, when he's moving around, I, I was really Im Im impressed by it. I was really impressed by how he moved around and his, when he plants and drives his speed pops, yeah. You know, like it really pops. Like you see it and you're like, oh, okay, wow. Wow. Well, and that's what's so cool about this, this, these corners that Notre Dame has right now, Brian, because they're all longer corners, right? You talk about Cam Hart, you talk about Benjamin Morrison, you talk about Christian Gray. I think the thing that separates those guys, though, is that they are really quick twitch athletes. You know, they're able to change direction really well. Like these aren't just, you see some of the longer corners in the NFL, for instance, that's like, you know, working vertically, 
you know, open it up and run, they could do that for days. But then when there's a hitch route, like you just can't get out of your pedal quick enough and explode and be able to make a play on the football. Notre Dame has length at that position, but they also have that quick twitch. And I'm glad you said that because I didn't think that Christian Gray was the six one that he was listed by most recruiting services, but I thought he was closer to six foot, if nothing else. Mm-hmm. Right. So I definitely think he's a little bit taller. Also a positive sign. If he looks skinny at 183 pounds, like that's like, man, he's going to be 200 pounds and probably pretty, pretty easily down the line at Notre Dame. So mm-hmm. cornerback looks like a continued a position of strength. Notre Dame doesn't really need Christian Gray to be that guy this year, but if he is, then that cornerback group gets even stronger. There was one other corner that you talked a little bit about, Brian. It sounds like Chance Tucker is quietly yeah. stacked back-to-back good days. Yeah, for me, he has. Like for again, from what we were able to see, but he he he's filled out. He definitely looks like he's he's putting good weight on starting to look a little bit more muscular than he has in the past. Uh, really clean movement, really good transitions. His plant and drive downhill is really good. Uh, he looked really comf- confident, you know, going through drills, like no second guessing, just, yeah, I'm, I'm a junior now. It's time for me to go play. Brian Bars look, Barnes look good in drills. I mean, the corners are, are really deep. It's a really yeah. good group, a really, really good group. So I, I, I've liked what I've seen so far. There's no doubt about it. And in your recap, you had one safety listed that you felt like really took on a big role, not only on field performance, but also leadership role. That safety is Xavier Watts. Yeah, he just, he's so vocal and active and he's like constantly like the first guy going through drills and, you know, he just, he moves at a different speed than all the other safeties and just everything that he does, just everything that he does. So yeah, he, he. I was impressed by with what I saw from Xavier. Not again, I didn't see him a ton today, but I saw him a lot today, and he was really impressive. He was really impressive to me. One of the key players for Notre Dame's defense this year, in my opinion, is Xavier Watts, because if he takes a step forward and there's natural maturation around him at the cornerback position, talking about a ball hawk potentially on on the second level from the middle of the field. So great to hear about Xavier Watts. Let's go to the offensive side of the ball, Brian. I know there was quarterbacks that you wanted to talk about. There was one, and I think that most people, you know, after our first as our first podcast recap the other day, everyone is obviously very excited about Sam Hartman. Well, but and they should be. And yes. they should be. And yeah. you mentioned Sam Hartman in here as well. So we'll sure. talk about him in a second. But you wanted to start the conversation off with Tyler Buckner. Yeah, man. He was really good today. So, you know, I thought he looked good in the first practice, Ryan, but but sitting here watching him today, man, he is. I mean, so a couple things that jumped out that are important. Number one, the ball was really just jumping out of his hand, right? We use that frame exploding out of your hand. What, what does that mean? It means when you throw the ball, it just pops off like a pitcher, and it just r- real tight spin. I think that was the thing. Vince even leaned over to me, and he was like, he's throwing it a lot tighter this year. You could just yeah. see it. So the way that his mechanics have been you know, tinkered with in the past, like whatever it was, the way he was releasing – the ball just wasn't coming out with the right, you know, with his hands and his arm, and it wasn't spinning as tight all the time as you'd want it to be. So maybe wobble a little bit. And I don't mind a wobble, but what, when a wobble is slow, the wind can affect it. It doesn't travel through the air as fast. I mean, it was popping out, man. Even when there weren't tight, tight spirals, it was tighter, meaning it was spinning really tight. And when that's happening, there's you're getting good velocity. It cuts through the air a lot better. If it's a windy day, it's going to cut through the air a lot better, especially it didn't matter today because we were indoors. But that was the first thing that jumped out. Like there was one. So what they do is they'll go four quarterbacks and each four quarterbacks are throwing to a different receiver. They run four receivers and routes. And, you know, they'll kind of go through their routes and they'll, they'll, they'll one guy throws the slide. One guy throws the end. One guy throws the corner. One guy throws the seam, that kind of thing. I'm just making routes up. I, I wasn't like a route combination they did today. And so they were doing one play where the, the a number two guy was running kind of like a wide fade. So like the slot would work wide and get vertical. Tyler drops back and, and it was probably about a about a 35, 30 to 35 yard throw past the line of scrimmage. And it just was a straight rope, Ryan. It never got more than 10, 11 feet high and came right down and just bam, hits the guy right in stride. And he had several throws like that. He threw about two or three corner routes that were just perfectly on the money. But here's the difference. His ball was getting out so quick, number one, timing-wise, but also the velocity that when he was throwing corners, guys were catching it and able to catch and then take a couple steps and then turn up field and get yardage where the other quarterbacks, for the most part, 
especially Minchie and Angeli, they were hitting those corners, but they were hitting it where the guy had one step and then he was out of bounds. Yep. Yeah, 20, 25 yard gain. But what Tyler was doing every time and, and what Sam was doing also better, but Tyler was really good with it today, is he was getting it off there with, such, with the timing. He was a plant on that corner step and then ball was coming out. He was getting good air on it, but it was get, it wasn't hanging up right. You can two guys can throw a football and they both get to the same trajectory and come down the same trajectory, but one gets there a lot faster. And Tyler's was getting up and getting down in a hurry, and that's what I talk about uh, a lot when I when I when I mention that. And it was getting up and down in a hurry. It was right on stride, and the guys were catching it and then just turning right up field and getting yards. That's a big. That's a difference between a twenty five yard gain and a fifty yard touchdown sure. if a guy is open, right? So he was hitting those. He had one throw that I saw today that was off target, and it was an in cut. And instead of being in the chest, it hit the guy in the thigh area. Guy caught it, it was no problem. But I mean, he was on point. His ball placement today was really good. His velocity is really good. He was throwing with confidence. He looked as good as I've seen him. But again, now I haven't seen him in a lot of practices. I'm talking about just seeing him in games, seeing him in, in high school, like the way the ball was jumping out of his hand. And then from what I saw on film of, of practices last year, this was the most just boom, just popping it out there that I've seen. And the ball placement was good. Yeah. So it wasn't like he was overexerting himself and trying to throw too hard. Yeah, the ball was getting out there, you know, extra, uh, you know, miles per hour, but it wasn't on target. It wasn't accurate. It wasn't catchable. That wasn't the case at all. So yeah. I thought Tyler, for the drills we saw, looked really good throwing the football. I mean, he was the best. He was the best thrower that they had today. Sam was the best throw they had on Wednesday, and Tyler was number two. Tyler was the best thrower today. Again, this is just the drills we saw. So I don't know about team and he could have thrown 57 interceptions and on and <laughs> seven on seven, just like Sam could have done that last on Wednesday. I don't know. But in what we saw, Ryan, that's that's the most confident, crisp, and accurate that I've seen Tyler Buckner. And and here's the thing: it was throw after throw after throw after throw. He was just on point from what I from what I saw. That's awesome, man. Sounds like a good confidence builder for Tyler. And I, I love to hear that he's kind of Sounds like he's really taken this competition seriously, right? Yeah. It sounds like he's really so, kind of put his best foot forward, it sounds. Yeah. Somebody forgot to tell him that uh, it, he, he doesn't have a chance to start this year. Right. Which right. is what we hear a lot, right? Somebody forgot to tell him that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and I know you had a couple notes. You already hit on Sam Hartman a little bit, but you had notes in your recap on Sam Hartman and Kenny Minchie. Yeah. You said had a, you know, a little bit up and yeah. down, but some really I mean, nice moments. Honestly, I won't be talking a lot about um, Sam Hartman in practice until we get to team stuff because yes. six-year senior, I want to see what he looks like in person. I want to see how the ball comes out of his hand. Yep, looks great. Okay, let's move on. Uh, here's some notes from today. Guess what? Sam Hartman throws a phenomenal deep ball. He has for five years. He's doing it again now. Right. He throws with good timing. I, you know, again, I don't know how he's handling team. Does he Does he grasp the offense? And all? I, I don't know the answer to that, but – just sitting back there going drills. Look, you know, he's got a good arm, strong arm, great deep ball. I'm surprised I'm still surprised. I'll say this, Ryan. The only thing I'm surprised by is how much him and the receivers seem to be on the same page. That surprises me a little bit. It, it, it does. It does. That tells you that tells you that they may have put in a lot of extra work in winter workouts, which is always a great yeah. sign, obviously, as a quarterback, especially one that's only going to be here for one year, right? When like, it, that's the everything things. we've heard, Ryan, about the yes. leadership that he showed this offseason, right? For that's, sure. That's the thing we weren't sure of. Um, you know, would he care to connect with the players? And we heard a lot of good things. And all he does, he works with them. He, he gets out there. He's showing leadership, et cetera, et cetera. And you're seeing it, right? Because that yeah. doesn't happen if they're not putting the work. Absolutely. So that, yeah, Absolutely. That's just the reality. Yep, they they it's a great sign, obviously, and hopefully continue to you know keep improving that connection that he has with the receivers, which is great to hear. Brian, talking about some of these wide receivers, I, I will not lie about. I, I want to say man. this about Kenny Minchie real quick. Yes, I'm sorry. He guys. had a bit of a rough day at times. Okay. So the drill is you you move. There's four quarterbacks throwing a, a different receiver. So there's four receivers in a route and four quarterbacks, and. There was a couple times where Kenny threw the ball to the same guy that another quarterback did. And Jelly, I think, did that once or twice as well. And then there's one time they're doing it. He was like, I don't know where I'm supposed to throw this ball. He didn't throw it. Tobias was like, dang, you know, like he wanted the ball. 
Uh, but he had a couple moments like that, which is going to happen when you're a young guy going through this for the first time. But when he did throw it, I mean, he, he that was a good ball. A couple times today, he he got his arm down a little bit, and it would come out on a funky angle, and, mm-hmm. and, and you know, looked like it was to the left. So I think he opened his hips up a little bit too much on his step, and it okay. dragged his elbow down, and the ball just came out on a funky angle. But outside of that, he throws a pretty ball. He he really does. He throws a pretty ball. Okay. And I'm excited to see him obviously continue to build up, coming back from that offseason shoulder injury that he was working back from. Just great to see him throw this spring, man. It's great to see just him back in action. Mm -hmm. A wide receiver that I'm really pumped up that you highlighted on here, Brian. I talked to Sean Davis again earlier. I talked, Obviously, you highlight the same player. Sounds like Lorenzo Styles was a little yeah. bit of a star today, man. A little yeah. bit. Well, I mean, again, it's going through individual drills, right? So yeah. who, who knows what he's doing in the team stuff. And that's true for everyone. It's just just keep in mind what we're talking about here. Yeah. A couple of things about Lorenzo that I was very happy to see today. Number one, he was looked fast, explosive, and was running confidently. Like he, he was playing a little bit of swagger today. You could just see it. But he was catching the ball really clean, Ryan. And so I'm, I'm watching Lorenzo every time he runs a route because I want to see how is he fighting the ball? Is he, you know, the stuff that we heard last year? Is he, is he, is he just letting it get into his body? Because a lot of times when guys lose confidence in their hands, they let they try to body catch everything. You know, is Lorenzo letting it get into his body, or is he kind of getting it out, catching it away from his body? He was catching it clean. He was doing all that. And that was great. Okay, good. And, and you like to see him get that confidence back. But there was a couple times where the balls were not. Throw. I think I think one time Angel, I think it might have been Angeli, threw him a pass, and it was like maybe two inches off the ground, and he just went down and snatched it really quickly off the ground and got up and and kept running like didn't fall down, like oh, okay. And there's a couple times he was really adjusting well to back shoulders. So I thought Lorenzo looked sharp. He was catching the ball clean on middle routes and on crossing routes. You know, just really not fighting because Ryan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You see guys when they're fighting the ball, when mentally fighting the football. I didn't see that from Lorenzo today, and that was encouraging to see because that obviously had been an issue for him all of last year. So you're getting Lorenzo. I mean, the only guy that I thought, the veterans that, that I thought dropped the ball today was Jaden Thomas misplayed a, a deep ball, a okay. really well-thrown seam route. I think it was from I think it was from Tyler Buckner, and he just misplayed it and short-armed it and it hit off right his finger. I mean, literally, like alligator armed it, and it hit off his fingers and was incomplete. But other than that, I mean – Braylon James caught the ball really well today, um, much better than he did on Wednesday. He looked clean. And then another guy that I wrote about, Ryan, was Rico Flores. Like his yeah. route running and pass catching ability really is impressive. He really stands out. Th- those kids can all really play. They really yeah. can. But Rico, Rico just knows what he's doing. Yes. He just, he's just not phased at all by being at Notre Dame from what we can tell. Yeah, him, him and Gene Greathouse are kind of in that same bucket of guys that just – are ready, you know, from a technical yeah. perspective and a mindset perspective. But it was great to hear from your report that Braylon James had a big – because the thing about the Monday practice is that – I mean, the, the first practice on Wednesday is that you saw, though, that there were still some incredible flashes from Braylon James, right? It's just about the technical refinement and being consistent, right? Like that's mm-hmm. what you need from Braylon. And it sounds like he obviously had a much improved day from that department – you also wanted to talk, I think, briefly about Tobias Merriweather, as we do frequently on this show, obviously. Yeah. I mean, it just, again, he's tall and really fast and caught the ball well. I, <laughs> the thing that I stand out about him is just he's really filled out well, you know, for a sophomore, but he he's really come, we talked about it on Wednesday. He's coming off the line with a really nice burst, playing with confidence. When, when they started off these drills, the first group out there again was Dion, Tobias, and Jaden Thomas again, which yeah. was good to see. This time, Dion was to the boundary and to buy I, yeah i'll have to get it I, i'm looking it does look to me like they're doing a little bit of left and right but we'll have to see a little bit on that but uh he looked good dion looks good i mean the veterans look good uh you know lorenzo obviously had a really good day but tobias just i mean he's just really talented his body control on back shoulders is really good he just he's got to continue to get stronger i would imagine just to be able to really win those contested throws the way that dion does but he looks he looks good. I mean, he's really athletic. And Holden Stace had another good day, just really big and just really filled out, catching the ball really well. Mitchell Evans looks exactly like he did in the bowl game. Just, you know, not the – doesn't look fast, but then you watch him, you're like, man, he covers a lot of ground in a hurry. He doesn't look he's got like the long he's running legs, fast. man. Yeah, like yeah. he doesn't look like he's running fast. And then you're like, dude, he got down there pretty – got up the seam on that route, like really quickly, even though he doesn't look 
fast. He's moving fast. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Michael Floyd was that way. Michael Floyd didn't look fast. And then he goes out in the combine. And everybody's shocked that he ran a four fight. I'm like, have you not watched this guy like run by people his entire no name <laughs> career? Right. Like they used him as like this intermediate guy in 2011, which is weird, but like eight, nine and 10, his first three years, Michael Floyd was just constantly beating people deep, but he didn't, yeah. he didn't run like he was a fast guy. Mitchell has a little bit of that. He just doesn't look fast, but he is moving fast for his size. It's, it's really, I don't know if I can explain uh, it correctly, Ryan. It's, it's, it's like, hard to explain, but it's like, you know, some yeah. guys like look fast. Yes. And, 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 um, uh, you just, you, you, they're like, man, that guy looks really fast. And sometimes guys look fast, but they don't actually test fast. And then there's right. times that guys that, that that's like, hey, that guy doesn't look like he's mo-. like Will Mallory. When I was watching the combine, he looked like he was running fast. He ran a four yes. five. Then yep. there's, I forget who the other tight end was that ran a four five. And I'm like, he didn't look like he was running a four five, but he ran a four five. Yep. And uh, that's kind of how I thought Mitchell Evans was. He wasn't, he didn't look fast. But he was moving quickly. He was covering a lot of ground. I, I, it's hard to explain, but it, it was well, I, I think I liked what I said. I think it's it, it's the body type stuff, right? I mean, I think for Notre Dame fans, like Brian, you remember when Cole Komet came out? I remember people said that Cole Komet was slow too, and that you're like, yeah. "Wow, you're in four seven flight at two hundred sixty pounds." Like, yeah, right. he can move a little bit. He's right. just long, man. Just like, looks long right because he's big and it looks like he's lumbering, but he's not yeah. really lumbering. And yeah, exactly. it was it was good. It was fun to see. No it, doubt. It just, Ryan, that's the biggest takeaway from today and because and, this was Vince's first chance to see this team in person. And he's like, dude, all I had knew is what you wrote, what you guys talked about in the show on Wednesday. And he's like, because remember, Vince was at the practices last year, you you, yep. you know, with with uh, in the last two years when I couldn't go. And he's like, this doesn't even look like the same team. Just the talent and the depth that receiver and quarterback is really. And honestly, this is part of the reason I was shocked that Tom Reese left. I'm going to be honest with you. Like I, I said this to you, Ryan, when he interviewed, I was like, I, I'll be a little surprised if he leaves. And you were like, why is that? And I was like, because he's worked, spent all this time recruiting all these guys to be here. Yeah. And now that they're here, he's going to let somebody else kind of, re- and, and, you know, but man, I'll tell you what, man, that the, the quarterback room, like last year, your number four was Ron Paulus in the spring. And at times during the season, he was your number three. And by the bowl game, he was your, you know, I mean, you know, late in the season, your bowl game, he was number three. And it's just now you're like, he's not even on the team. And you're talking about Kenny Minchie and Steve Angeli are battling it out for the number three and number four spot. And, Seriously. you know, Tyler Buckner was the number one last year. Now he's the number two and he's throwing the ball way better than he did a year ago from the stuff that I saw, the drills and stuff that I saw last year on film. And the receiver room looks way, because remember last year, like, Dion had a penny on half the spring, which penny is a red jersey, means you can't get contact. Yep. You know, Lorenzo was struggling, fighting the ball. You didn't have Tobias, Tobias wasn't in the here. spring. Avery yep. Davis was hurt. Joe Wilkins was hurt. You know, you're out there with Matt Salerno. I have yet to see Matt Salerno take a rep with the twos, much less the ones so far, because they got Chris Tyree working in the slot. And by the way, he doesn't catch the ball down the field very well, but you get him the ball in under 10 yards, he's going to catch it. And he is just. Explo- I mean, you see the explosiveness, Ryan. He is just, I mean, yeah. he's just, and I talked to somebody, I talked to a couple of people that are like in one-on-ones that re- DBs just can't guard him. He's just too fast. They just can't keep up with him. You know, because there's run like in cuts and slants and crossers and stuff. And they're just like, it's just about pure speed. And it's like, nobody can run with them. Yeah. And you're like, it's about time they figured out ways to get this kid to freaking football. <laughs> but I mean, it just, the overall talent at receiver right now is just, just ridiculous. Now, will any of them step up in games? We we don't know that, but right now, March twenty fifth, oh God, I can't, I can't. It's been a long time because, like, even in like eighteen, right, where in the spring of eighteen, you had Chase Claypool and and Fink and Boykin, and you're all excited, but like they didn't not, hardly any of those eighteen freshmen were early enrollees. There's like this huge drop off between the first team, first three, four guys. Now you're talking about. I'd even notice Jaden Greathouse today. I talked Crazy. about a bunch of receivers. And I don't even remember seeing Jaden Greathouse today. It's uh, it's absolutely loaded. Caleb Smith is, you know, looks solid, but a guy that was an All ACC performer a year ago just looks like a guy in this room, you know, yeah. with how with how talented it is, and and that just speaks volumes. And I mean, I mean, Vince is in the chat, so if you're in the chat, you can you can ask him, man. It 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 was so night and day different than way the what in the past. Just just God given talent. Just watch this room. These guys run around the size, the speed. 
Jaden Greathouse is 6'1", a little over 6'1", 213 pounds, and he looks small in, yeah. in this room. It's – um, it's man, it's it's impressive to see. And well, the tight ends look good, too. I mean, yeah. Holden Stace and Mitchell Evans look really good so far in practices. Yeah. They do. Well, well, Brian, one of the first comments we had in here before we even started was someone was like, "Does it is it me or does these wide receivers just look like they're moving at a different speed than they have in the past? And I'm just like, no, yeah. You're, you're, yeah, you're right. You're right. I think that's also partly, and I think Vince just said something about, you know, you have to give a lot of credit to Chancey Stucky. Yes. Because the one thing is, when you become more technically sound and comfortable with what you're doing on the football field, what do you do? You play faster, right? So your yeah. ability to tap into that athletic profile, I think, is what you're seeing at those wide, at the wide receiver position, especially. So it's it, great it to is. see, man. And they it's look. Great com- to see. Here's the thing, too. Receiver play, Ryan. You got to be athletic and catch. But receiver is such a confidence position. You have to have confidence in what you're doing. You have to have comp, and you can tell that these kids believe that they know what they're doing. And that yeah. comes from having faith in what they're being taught. You can see it very clearly. This is a very – we saw a few more balls hit the ground today, but a lot of them were just misses from the young quarterbacks, to be honest with you. But the receivers just – you don't see drop. I think Jane Thomas had the only drop. Jane Thomas has very dependable hands in games. We've seen him do it. I mean, he had the only drop today. And he just – and I think – and honestly, I think the reason he dropped it is because the ball just kept going. I think he yeah. thought it was going to drop here, and it ended up going here because it was just such a rope from Tyler Buckner. I just think he misjudged it because it got on him so quickly. But I mean, he, it, it's just Ryan. It's it's so much different than yeah. what it was in the fall. I mean, just so much different. It's going to be the, fun. It's it gonna is going to be fun here. It's going to be really fun. And one of the biggest competitions this, this uh, spring into the into next season, Brian is. At offensive guard, and one couple players that you wanted to highlight are a part of that offensive guard battle. You know, it sounds like you got a little bit more of a closer look at some of the offensive very linemen little, today. Just a yeah. very little bit, and it's just more about. I don't pay any attention to Joe Walt and Blake Fisher. They're dudes, right? I don't. I don't need to watch Zeke Carell to confirm. Look, Zeke. Zeke to me, I don't care a thing about Zeke Carell as long as he's healthy until we get out in the fall next year, and I want to see him build on what he did last year. Like he's the center. Right, he's the leader. I don't. I don't care to see a thing from Joe Walt this spring. I don't. I mean, he's a freshman All American. He was first team All American last year. He is what he. I want to see. What about those other guys? What about the guards? Right. How are the guards going to play? Are they going to drag Zeke's play down because he's gotten to worry about them? Or are they going to play their way? So I watched a little bit of Billy Shroud today, and he looks like a million bucks, man. He is a really <laughs> thick built kid. He's a typical Midwestern Northern type of lineman, just barrel chested big kid, and he moves really well in drills. Now I haven't seen him hit a single defensive player. I haven't seen him execute a single assignment, so I don't get too in too much into it. And that's why I didn't talk too much about it. But he he's moving well, really well in drills. And Andrew Kristoffic, despite being up to three hundred five now, was moving pretty well today too. He was another guy that impressed me. They're the two most talented looking guards that Notre Dame has that, that I could tell to, today. Anyway, that that's that's my um, that's my takeaway. I love it, man. I love it. So again, that's that's kind of most of the that I think we hit on every point that you had as far as your your kind of update and observations for practice. Before we move on to the mailbag and transition, let me say one more thing too. Let me say one more thing too. It was actually kind of cool. So they had this pipeline of recruits coming to Marcus Freeman in middle practice. So he's like standing like midfield, like watching everything, and he just constantly kept bringing a recruit and his parent to him. It was (laughs) wild. It just it was like a it's like a line of people going to meet the king, you know what I mean? Just like, and uh, so we got to see Justin Scott. He's legit big. Uh, we saw saw Dominic Hulick. He's a big kid. Saw saw a lot of the kids that were there today. Uh, Tylen Taylor's a little taller than I thought he was going to be. Uh, Taylen Taylor, excuse me. Yeah. He's a really impressive looking athlete, Ryan. He's a really impressive looking athlete. Like he's gonna like you. I mean, you know my stance on him. He's a dude. But that was pretty cool deal, man. Like just the organization. For all the recruits were there, just constantly bringing like one kid out after another to meet Coach Freeman and all that and stuff like that. He, uh, it was an impressive deal, man. It was a really impressive deal. I love that, man. I love that. I really do. And and like I said before, to open this show, if you're just joining with us live here on YouTube, go to boards.irishbreakdown.com because me and Sean Davis will be having a lot of intel over the next, you know, 24 hours. Actually, less than that. You know, probably some tonight and maybe some more tomorrow morning as far as some recruiting intel of how some of these visits went. Like Brian said, Justin Scott is, is on campus. Logan Thomas, the defensive end out of the state of Texas in 2024, is on campus. 
a lot of talented 2025 kids. There's it's it's a busy weekend for Notre Dame football. John yeah. Mitchell out of Florida, the cornerback, is on campus. There's a lot of dudes on campus this weekend, man. So make sure to go to boardsatirishbreakdown.com. Brian, before we transition, any other player notes you want to throw in there, or are we good to move on? Yeah, I'm just looking forward to seeing some more defensive stuff. Like, because it, it, you know, defense is so much, but yeah, it's good that guys look athletic. You're on scholarship at Notre Dame, you should look athletic, sure. right? But I want to see yeah. them get the pads on, and that's going to be the big thing for me. Uh, looking forward to – I'll probably wait till after Monday's practice. That'll be practice four. So then you're kind of a little over a quarter of the way through before I reach out to pe- you know too many people. Hey, how do how'd it go? How do people look? That kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I, I was I'm, – I'm, I'm excited because you can just – you can just like – I've done this a long time, Ryan, I, as, a, as a football coach and then, you know, doing this job. And, and you kind of – somebody asked, you know, how does it care, you know, most excited you've been about Springs? You you could kind of tell, you can kind of tell when there's something with a team. Sure. You could kind of tell that 2018 team had something. You could see in the spring of 2017 that they, they had come, you know, Harry Heastan and Chip Long had completely changed the demeanor of that offense, that they were just going to play with a completely different edge than what they played with in 2016. You could just see it in the spring, you know, and then of course it carries over. And, and this team, it's early. This team just looks really confident and really athletic and that's something that i'm i'm really excited to see it's a very talented football team and you're you're seeing a lot of young guys playing i mean getting reps getting opportunities now will they when will that be the case come august i don't know but they're getting a lot of work they're giving those guys a a lot of chances to go out there and compete and play well that's something that i like to see uh, from from this group yeah Yep, and obviously we'll have a couple more opportunities to see this team up close and personal in spring practice. One on a more, you know, not as quite as limited basis. So make sure, again, boards.averagebreakdown.com. Continue to have team intel, recruiting intel, everything you need to know. The analysis, obviously, you guys know where to come to. So wanna, before we move on to the mailbag, we are going to get the mailbag in a second. Keep throwing those questions in the chat. A little MB in front of the question is always very much appreciated. Yes, sir. Wanted to say this too. This is the point yeah. I believe Vince said to me. Um, Jared Parker almost never talks to the quarterbacks. This is something that I noticed Wednesday and today. He lets Gino talk to the quarterbacks. Like it, the only time he talks to the quarterbacks is when he's letting them know, here's what we're about. This is the routes we're going to run. You know, but like when it comes to correction, it's Gino's deal. Gino's the only guy that talks to the quarterbacks right now, which is important because we've said this before, like when Tommy Reese was here and Brian Kelly was here, Tommy coached the quarterbacks, but then you always had Brian Kelly in their ear and all that. You know what I mean? Like I'm a big fan of, I want one guy in their ear. So that's been something I like to see as well. There's only been one quarterback in their ear, which one one coach in their ear, which is important. One unified voice is something that I always talk about. And that's very, very important. So we're going to move on to the mailbag here before we do. MB's in the chat. Get those mailbag questions for it. If you are listening to us live on YouTube, if you can hit that like button, we very much appreciate it. If you want to share the podcast, we also very much appreciate that. Subscribe to this podcast, as you always should. Five-star reviews if you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform. Generally appreciate that. That's, but this is going to conclude our spring practice observations. We're here coming to you live on a Saturday. So I want to thank you all for joining this section of the podcast. We'll get into the mailbag next, but thank you for joining this section of the Irish Breakdown podcast. All right, Brian, mailbag time, buddy. Let's get it going. We have um, a lot of questions, so let's let's start working through them a little bit here. And uh, this one is from, of course, John A1. John, thank you so much, as always, for your contributions to the mailbag. We really do appreciate it. Said, how many wide receivers will be in the rotation actually get in game snaps in 2023? I mean, it's hard to go beyond five per game. It's hard to go beyond that. That's why I think special teams needs to be a thing for those guys this year. They need to be on some coverage teams, especially some of the guys that have played defense before, you know, be a part of the return team. It, and and then, you know, hopefully you can have some early season blowouts to get those guys some touches. But it's it's hard to go past five. You can get to six if you're if you're running a lot of eleven personnel. You can get to six. Yeah. But if you're half eleven and half 12, 21, 20, whatever, it's a lot hard. Well, twenty actually helps you too because you're in three three receivers. But if you're doing a lot of twelve and twenty one personnel, as with that, it's hard to get six guys 
really comfortable in into because like part of the thing is around you've got to get the reps to where you're getting the game work in you're you're getting up to the game speed and you're getting into the flow of things and if you're rotating too many guys and nobody just really gets comfortable and gets kind of rolling so sure if you're going to do a lot more 11 personnel this year then yes you can you can you can go to six to a degree and how you mainly do it ryan is what i would do is is i'd have a couple personnel groupings where a couple of those guys who don't play a ton like hey uh so and so you're our 12 personnel guy, you know, or you're, uh, you're our, when we go 21, you're, you're the guy that we go there, you know, that kind of thing where you can maybe have, you know, Caleb Smith may not be the starter in 11 personnel, but when you go 12 personnel, he's out there into the boundary, you know, and you, you mix it up a little bit uh, to start those things off. I mean, those are different things that you can do to get those guys going, but I mean, it's, it's, Five is I'm really comfortable with five. I think you can get to six if you do it the right way, in my view. And, and I, I think the question is coming because there's so many wide receivers that seem like they can contribute, which is a very interesting conversation, right? right. I mean, you're talking about Jaden Greathouse, Rico Flores. Could they crack the rotation? For sure. Could it be a possibility where there's just a little bit too much depth in front of them? It's also possible, you know, like it really is, which is why – we're so optimistic about the wide receiver units. You know, for me, Brian, it's like there's a lot of guys that can play and can contribute this year, in my opinion, on that wide receiver group, which is a very different vibe than some past years at Notre Dame and a vibe that we needed to get here. Because, again, man, last spring we're dealing with four scholarship receivers at one point in spring ball, and I think one of them had the red penny on, man. Like, it was tough times at some points there. It, it was, man. It, it's a different universe right now, Ryan. I mean, you had Drew Pine – running both of the first team offenses in the blue gold game. Yep. You know, like it's a different universe. It is a very different universe. Can I say this before we move on to the next question? Because I just got reminded of it in the chat by Ian. I I saw that everyone was, was really pumped up about the Notre Dame football team being at the lacrosse game today as well. And apparently it was like a really cool kind of vibe to the game, which was just yeah. really nice to see me. I've literally had somebody that's not a Notre Dame fan tag me on Twitter. It was like, dude, that's so cool that Coach Freeman and the whole team was out there at the lacrosse game, like really yeah. dope type yeah. of thing. So. And he's done a lot. Like he flew down to Greensboro for uh, the ACC tournament, you know, watch yeah. the women's basketball, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, he's – um, yeah, he's uh, – he's a uh, – He's re- you see a lot of that. You see a lot of that support from other sports more and more and more. You see football players at the women's basketball games all the time. So I I, I love to see that. You know, I, I yes. really do. I really do. It's, no doubt uh, about it. You, you, I mean, like these kids are all kind of going through the same thing in their own way, right? Like they're all going through their their same struggles and and they should be supporting each other, you know, yep. and – to me, that's I mean, that's just a really cool, really cool thing. That's what to me, that's what college athletics is supposed to be about when you look at those athletes. Yep. It's supposed to be about that camaraderie where, hey, you have our back, we have yours. And you know, the reality is is the football, the learning football team can, you know, they can um they can have a big run. Now, of course, it didn't work out for the lacrosse team. They 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 ended up losing to Virginia today, but you know. It stuff matters. I mean, I mean, I mean, losing to Virginia in the cross is nothing to be like, you know, yeah, well, ashamed Notre Dame about, was though. Number one coming into the <laughs> yeah. game. So, yeah. and Virginia was number three. I was about but to yeah, say, historically, Virginia is just excellent at lacrosse, like every single year it feels yep. like. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. So, anyway. Yeah, I – uh yeah, I, I I like what he's doing, man. I do. So we, we, yeah. we got a we had a super chat down here. I want to get to here from Brian Richmond. Brian, thank you so much for the super chat. This question was: When was the last time you have seen this much talent at Notre Dame, considering all positions and depth? Oh, 2015, easily. Yeah. I mean, look, 2015 is still the more talented team as of right now, because that team had more proven guys. I mean, you knew what Will Fuller could do. He's coming off a thousand yard season. You knew Jalen Smith was a freaking dude. He had just done it the year before. Like you knew that 2015 team had talent. A lot of the guys that got injured in 2014 were back. You know, Drew Tranquil was back. Uh, Sheldon Day was back. You know, Jerron Jones was healthy again in spring, in the spring. He, on the, he obviously getting hurt, got hurt in fall camp. 
that team had a ton. Jerry Tiller was an early enrollee. You can see early on that he was he was the talk of spring. He was so overhyped during spring that it was almost like there was no way he could live up to expectations by the fall. Yeah. I mean, because he looked so good in the spring, you're like, there's no way he can carry this into the fall that way. And he did okay in the fall, but he he you know he he obviously wasn't going to be the way that people hyped him up to be. But you could see the talent on that 2015 team. I mean. Torian Folson had a great spring in 2015. You had you had Malik coming back, had a great spring, and you know you're just going to be loaded at running back. And and uh, that 2015 team was loaded. This team is comparable to that from a God given ability standpoint. But the difference is that 2015 team, Mike McGlinchey had started the previous year, uh, you know, and, and so you kind of knew like late in the year, you kind of knew what he could bring to the table. You know, you knew what Steve Elmer could bring to the table. So you, you know Nick Martin could bring to the table. Quentin Nelson was really the only new guy in that lineup that year. Ronnie Stanley, you knew what he brought to the table. So you, you, you know, Durham, you were going in that year. Durham Smythe, remember, was going to be the starting tight end. He had a you know he was a guy that showed a lot of potential the year before. He ended up getting hurt early next year. But and Ryan, that that 2015 team was loaded. But I, the difference is that team had a lot more proven playmakers compared to this team. Now, could this team match that to some degree? Yes, absolutely it can, but it's not there yet. It's not there on day three of spring practice. But athletically, it's the closest we've seen to that group, athletically, top to bottom. I I just love hearing that 2015 offensive line every time, Brian, because it's just like four of five were multi-year starters in the NFL, and you have at least, what, two pro bowlers in there? Mike McClitch just signed a huge deal. Like, just – Ridiculous right. offensive line. In and Steve Elmer would have played in the NFL if he, if football was his passion. Sure. I, have, I, no, I don't say that negatively at all, but I mean, he was a two year starter and left after his junior year to go work in Washington, D.C. Yep. So, I mean, yeah, uh, it was a loaded group, dude. And and up front, you had a bunch of NFL players. You had Isaac Rochelle, Sheldon Day, yep. Jerry, Till- uh, Jerry Tillery, Jerron Jones before he got hurt, Romeo Quara. Was I mean, literally NFL players across the board, except that my linebacker, Kavari Russell at corner on that team, Cole Luke at corner on that team, Max Redfield, Elijah Matthias Farley started for a was one of the best players for the Colts one year, not not long ago, was a full year starter and had almost 100 tackles. And he couldn't even start on that 2015 Notre Dame defense, yeah, because Elijah Shoemate and Max Redfield were just better. So I had this tells you how, how loaded that team was. They just weren't coached well. This team is going to be coached better than that team at most positions. This team has a chance to be there, but they're just not there yet. And the biggest reason they have a chance to be there, Ryan, is quarterback. Yeah. This is the best quarterback room they've had since I'd say 2014. Right. It's even better than 2015 room, it, you know, because Wimbush was a freshman, Deshaun was a redshirt freshman, and then you had Malik who'd started one game. This year you have you know Everett like yeah, the, the 2014 room is Everett, Deshaun Kaiser, Malik Zaire. That was a loaded quarterback room. Yeah. Now you're looking at that. Plus you have Steve Angeli as your number four, or your, you know your fourth best talent, in my opinion. So, I uh, yeah, it, it's got a chance to be that Ryan. It's got uh, Brian. It's it's got a chance to be like that team. It's got more talent top to bottom than the 2020 team for sure. Yeah, uh, you know the difference is the 2020 team had just a lot more guys that we knew what they could do. This team sure. has a lot more question marks, but from a god, just a god given ability, just talent standpoint, it's not close. Way more depth on this team, way more speed on this team, uh, way more. I'm just everything is better. You know, you're talking about that year. You had Ben Skaronski and Javon McKinley and Avery Davis. And then Kevin Austin got hurt. Braden Lindsey was hurt. You know, that, that was a pretty thin group without a lot of speed. And Javon yeah. McKinley was your deep threat at, who ran a four, five, seven at the combine. You know, this group you're talking about the talent they have. I mean, right now Lorenzo Styles is not running with the ones. Wild. That's yeah. all you need to say. Yeah. And and he's pl- having a good spring so far. So that that might change. But yeah, it's um, they're 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 talent wise they're loaded now. Does that mean they're going to go out and win a bunch of games? Remains to be seen. But just God-given abilities, man, right now, it's hard not to be fired up by this. Yeah. It, it really is hard not to be fired up. So, yeah. So let's get to the next question. I'm sitting there like waiting on you to bring up the next question, and that's my job. So, <laughs> whoopsie. <laughs> 
<laughs> My bad, everybody. <laughs> From John A1, he said, what are some true slot routes that Chris Tyree can become proficient in before the season starts? Well, the big thing is all the screen stuff. Bubble screens, yep. now screens, tunnel screens. Uh, and then the other one is going to be they do – I'd like to see them do this thing the other teams do. It, it looks like a crossing route, but the offensive line like really sinks – their pass set to get the D line downfield. And then you just replace them with him. And then the other receivers kind of go downfield. It's almost like a tunnel screen, but it, it doesn't look as much like a screen to the snap because he's actually running like what looks like a crossing route on that. I don't see Notre Dame do that a ton. Oklahoma state runs this play a ton. And, you know, maybe they can incorporate that, but it, the screen stuff crossers, yeah. pitches, options, quick outs, all that quick game stuff needs to be a big part of his repertoire. The reason yeah. I say that is, is because the concern is a guy like Chris Tyree, if he's not comfortable catching a ball, he runs a little quick option route, isn't certain of the of the route, gets his head around slow. Next thing you know, it hits his 5'9 face and then falls up in the air and it gets tipped in for an interception, right? You, you, you need to be proficient with your route running so that way you're attacking and getting back to the football, getting your eyes back to the football, getting your hands in, in proper catch position when the ball's coming, those type of things. Uh, so any of the quick game stuff has to be he has to be proficient with because that's the stuff that gets dangerous if you're not sure of what you're doing. All of a sudden, a, what you think is a simple hitch route isn't so simple. You know, yeah. we saw this last year. Why was Marshall able to bait the Notre Dame quarterback Tyler Buckner into mistakes? Twofold. One is they read Tyler, and number two is the receivers would come off the line, and it was very clear that they were about to run something quick. There was no selling the go route and just the simple, those simple mistakes. Jaden Thomas not stepping to the football on a hitch route in the boundary is the difference between an incomplete pass and a pick six game over. Yep. Right. It's that kind of stuff. Those can be big mistakes if you're not sharp with that stuff. And so that's the big thing for me. Overs like uh, which are just drags, overs, stuff like that, all are things. And then wide fades, which we've seen him actually catch those in college before. Those are the main things. Like I don't need to see Chris Tyree running seam routes because honestly, unless it's like a hot pass where you you think you can get him open, I I don't like throwing to five foot nine slot receivers who aren't real receivers, you know. But I'll say this: Chris Tyree looks a lot better running routes than I thought he was going to look as a slot guy. He still doesn't catch the ball incredibly great down the field, but I just added a note to my practice report that I forgot that earlier about him. But he, the stuff that's ten and in, he caught the ball clean. He did. He caught the ball pretty clean, which was good to see. Yeah, I mean, I I think that one thing that I would harp on, and you already mentioned it, but for me, hitches and then a, a bunch of a bunch of things that give him kind of a two way go. So you mentioned option routes, whip routes. Like the reason that you're putting Chris Tyree in the slot, Brian, is because you're trying to take advantage of mismatches, right? Like I want to get him one on one against a linebacker, against a slot defender, occasionally, right? Guys that made that he is by far more explosive than, right? So I want to give him options as far as let's break it out, let's break it in. I mean, you think about like everyone talks about the play, the long play he had against Oklahoma State, right? That was an angle route. Like that was literally setting a guy up, sticking him, and then hitting it right th to the inside in, on a quick break, right? So I want to give him the option to, hey, man, if that guy's just staying off of you, let's just hit the easy hitch, right? Get the ball in your hands, then make something happen after the catch. If not, and a guy's trying to press you a little bit or getting close to your face – Let's give him some option routes, man. Let's give him some whips. Let's give him a two-way go. When I say a two-way go, you hear slot cornerbacks talk this a lot because they it's hard to get help from both sides of you, right? So give him an opportunity to – the guy gives me a little bit of an outside leverage, I'm going to work inside. If he gives me a little bit of inside leverage, I'm going to work outside. Let Make the, the defender wrong. Give him options as far as where he can break out and then get the football in his hands and let him work, man. Create space. That's the best way to do it, in my opinion, some of those option routes. I got to bring up this question, Ryan, and I got to say I'm very offended that this uh -oh. question is even being asked from Johnny S. Here, I got to bring this up. One, go ahead and read this one, Ryan. Yeah, Johnny says, "When do you, we see an anchorman type gang fight with IB, ISD, Blue and Gold, Irish Illustrated? And which one of you is Ron Burgundy?" Why he is has that the same question the other day. He has the same but here's the, the thing: day. Why is that even being asked? We all know who Ron Burgundy is. I mean, why why is that being asked? Come on now. First of all, who's the guy that everybody hates the most? Uh, this guy, right? That's not true. That's and, not true. and who's the big guy? Who's the who's the big dog, right? So I'm sorry. Yeah, that's that's got to be me, man. And I'm and and I'm also uh, upset that you're leaving all the TV people out of this, right? 
True. My guy Levon Whitaker, they be fifty seven, needs to be a part of this. Andrew Sanders needs to be part of this. This this bat if we're gonna if we're gonna do it right, you know. So uh, we got the Spanish guy that comes and covers practices sometimes. Dead serious. Why isn't he being mentioned here? You know what I'm saying? That that fits with the movie, right? They had Spanish uh, Spanish language TV. Thank you. So I'm just uh, I'm a little upset with you, Johnny. I'm a little upset that you even needed to ask who Ron Burgundy would be in that situation. Vince, um, you know, Vince in the chat said it wouldn't even be a fight. Yes, it wouldn't even be a battle. I have a lot of <laughs> leather bound books. You know, I smell like rich mahogany. I'm sorry, that's me, man. Come on now. So <laughs> I, I'm just upset that he would even ask that question. I just, uh, yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little hurt, Johnny. So, hurt. Sometimes, sometimes you need the easy <laughs> answers, Brian. You need the easy answers. <laughs> there, you there you go. Here we go. Let's get back on track. From Rob Osgood, thank you for the question, Rob. In your opinion, what should the offense scoring average be per game and then for the big three games, Ohio State, USC, and Clemson? So you're at 31 last season, right, Brian? You're at yeah. 31 points per game last season. I mean, yeah, over 35 for sure, right? Like yeah. that has to be like uh, 36, 37, like somewhere in that ballpark, right? I mean, Ish. It's got to be minimum 36, but again, yeah. it's got to be closer to 38 to 40 because if you're, because here's the key it's the second part of the question that matters. Yeah. That's really the one that matters here. And Notre Dame has had years where they scored 35, 36, 34 points per game, and then they get out in these big games and they couldn't score. Right. Right. And, and that's, those are the things that kind of w- will, will haunt you. Is is when you're doing those things, and to me, Ryan, that's that's the big key. Is can you score in those big games? And you, you look at last year, for example. You know, offense falls short against Ohio State. Offense falls short against South Carolina. South, you know, USC. I mean, you know, yep. 2021 offense completely falters against Cincinnati in the regular season. 2020, you know, offense just completely sputters against Clemson and Alabama down the stretch. You know, again, same thing in 19. Notre Dame goes out there. Has a school a school record for points and second highest points per game average I think in school history at thirty six point eight, and and uh, you know but but what do they do in the games that matter Ryan, you know they go out against uh, that year in twenty nineteen against Georgia and they they score seventeen points lose by six they get the ball with about two minutes in the game in Georgia territory a touchdown wins the game and they couldn't even get like inside to twenty didn't right. threaten them at all. You score 14 points against Michigan. You know, it's been that mantra throughout, Ryan. You get into the playoffs and, and you know, you're scoring at that time. They were, you know, scoring pretty well under Ian Book. Now, that year was interesting because, you know, that season, Ryan, you know, your overall scoring average is like 31 point something. But the scoring average of Ian Book as the quarterback was a lot different. Yeah. Uh, because they only scored, you know, 24, 24, and 22 points that first stretch i'm i'm trying to just give me a second I'm, I'm adding it up here real quick you know but when ian book was a starting quarterback that year see they played uh, nine games actually eight games so i'll count the one with brandon in there because the offense was really rolling but in those nine games they scored 37.2 points per game but That's then good. they get to the ch- the playoff game and what happens they can't score and this has been the mo throughout you know 2017 explosive offense that stretch of football uh, i'm he, he, look at this so they they played boston college on uh september 6th and that started a stretch of seven games where they scored 49 38 52 33 49 35 and 48 points in a in a seven game stretch and they beat let's see one to two ranked the three ranked opponents, two teams during that stretch, Ryan, that finished in the top 15 is what Notre Dame did. And so during that, during that seven game stretch, they averaged 43.4 points per game. But what happened in between that stretch? 19 points against Georgia, eight against Miami. Yep. That's what that's what the book ends of, of that stretch. It's always been the thing is I don't care what they're if they score 40 points a game this year but go for 17 against Ohio State and 20 against USC and lose those two games or 20 against Clemson and lose those two games. If they score 70 on Tennessee State and 59 against Central Michigan and 49 against Navy and and that type of thing, then I don't care if they average 38 points a game or 40 points a game. 
because they didn't score to mattered. On the flip side, if you can score 28 to 31 points in those other games, you're going to have a shot yep. to win those games. You are. And not every one, sometimes like USC last year, you needed 38, right? I mean, or you needed 39. But more often than not, Notre Dame hasn't needed that. Like even against Miami in 2017, they lost 41 to eight and two pick sixes. Yes. I mean, defense kept that game close for a while. I well, mean, wasn't after, it by it wasn't by the same guy too? I know Trajan Bandy had one. Didn't he have two in that might game? Have been. It was he crazy. Might have tipped the yeah. other one. Yeah. But yeah, it was uh, you know, so it wasn't like the defense played terrible. You know no. what I mean? They fit, they folded late because they were just on the field for so long. But you know, if the offense steps up, then it takes a lot of that pressure off of the defense. That's the reality of it. Yep. You know, and you know, that's where I want to get to. That's yeah, man. Where I get to. Ultimately, the next offensive play call in this offense this year is going to be Judge Brian, to your point. About those pillar games, man, that's what matters, right? Like when you see the best, can you get the best out of your offense? Like that's mm-hmm. kind of what you want to see, man. Like I, to your point, like if they score 79 against Tennessee State, like that's cool. But like – Right. And then score 10 against show- Ohio State. Yeah. You know, like let's just say they score 63 points against Ohio – against Tennessee State and they score yeah. 10 against Ohio State. And they say, hey, they're averaging 36 and a half points per game. That's really good. Don't care. Don't care. Yeah. Don't care. You know, so it, it's the big games. Give me 27 to 31 in those big games, and this team's going to be doing some. Because then you don't need to score 70 against Tennessee State. And that's really that's really what it boils down to for me, Ryan, is I, I want to see more of that, to be completely honest with you. And yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a point here real quick. Uh-huh. Georgia this year in the um let me see it here real quick. So Georgia this year made it to the college football playoff and they scored, let's see, 92 minus 65 equals divided by 12. They averaged 38.3 points per game this year Mm -hmm. in the regular season. They actually averaged a lot more points in the postseason than they did in the regular season. They scored 50 in the SEC title game, 42 in the playoff, and 65 in the TCU for all the people to say it's defense that wins championships. Uh, Georgia gave up 71 points combined in the SEC title game in the first playoff game and still won. Uh, but the thing is, in, in that year, right, they, they scored 38.3, but they only scored 33 against Samford, right? They only scored 37 against Georgia Tech. They scored 16 against Kentucky. When they were at their best was usually against the teams that were ranked. Scored 49 against Oregon, 48 at South Carolina, 27 against Tennessee, and the defense played great, 45 at Mississippi State, 50 against LSU, 42 against Ohio State, and 65 against TCU. They were the exact opposite. They played their worst in the crap games. Yeah, They played their best in the big games. That's what champions do. They don't beat up on the, the cupcakes. They blow out the good teams. And if you go back and look at that 1988 season, some of Notre Dame's worst games were against like Rice, Purdue, like not very good teams. Cause the, the, they're like, and, and I remember reading about reading Lou Holtz wrote about this in one of his books. He was like, it, it's hard to get those kids. Cause those kids know how good they were and they knew how bad Navy was, yep. you know? And so you, you'd see them in some of those games where it's like, they just weren't that good or they weren't that dominant. But then when they played a good team, man, they would turn on the Jets. It wasn't Purdue. It was Michigan State. They blew Purdue out that year. Yeah, but like Pitt, they beat Pitt 30-20. to 20. If you go back and, and watch that game, it's like – because you know why? Pitt was 6-5 and five that year. They weren't that good. Hmm. Do you know why? Because they're like, we know we're better than these guys. We got Miami coming up next. right? So you just got to do enough to beat those games, and then you are bringing it when the best teams are there. That's what the best teams do. The champions do. And that's why Ohio State's not a champion. The last two years loaded with talent, but in the big games, Ohio state's offense sputtered the last two years. They sputtered against Notre Dame. Let's be honest about that. And they sputtered twice against Michigan. That's, that's the reality of it. The only yep. problem is Notre Dame's offense sputtered even more. Yes. You know, so that's the reality of it. Yep. Those big games, man. That's the thing that needs to change most. We've talked about this. We've talked about it. That, no, we know Notre Dame can beat some of those lower level teams. I know it wasn't perfect this year in that regard, but at the end of the day, man, those pillar games are the ones that we're going to be talking about at the end of the season, Brian, going into the postseason, right? How'd you do against Ohio State? How'd you do against USC? How did you do against Clemson? Those are the games that matter most 
because those are the games that show if Notre Dame is getting close to that next level of football or if they're just going to stay a good program, good program, 10 wins a year, cool, but not a legitimate contender to win a national championship, not a legitimate one. That's the difference. Yep, absolutely. Let's get to the next one here from uh, one of the OGs. Here we go. From Notre Dame 2164, it said Rocco Spindler was ranked number 60 overall and the number three offensive lineman in the class. And he did say in the next comment after that, Brian, that he just using the the he was just using the ranking for just a baseline. So sure. don't get mad. No, I mean, look, it's about expectations, right? I mean, that's what sure. the expectations that were that Rocco is going to be a really good player, and I completely understand that. Yep. And, and you know, t- yeah. And so to me, um, look. Part of the deal is this: if he doesn't start this year, he's he'll be backing up other highly ranked guys. Billy Strouth was a top hundred guy. Uh, Andrew Kostovic was a top two hundred guy, and he's three years older than two years older than Rocco. That's gonna be that's gonna be part of it to me. And yeah. so I want to see that like be discussed sometimes. Like a lot of times, well, this guy was ranked high, and he. he he didn't pan out. Well, who did he back up? Another guy that ranked pretty high. But the re- at the end of the day, his feet just got slow nice. and really heavy. And until that changes, that's that's the thing. Rocco's strong. He fights. He battles. He competes. He's just really slow-footed. Yes. That's the problem. That's and the problem. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing how he does this spring, Brian, because we talked about it yesterday, right? It's like – 325 now you gained another 10 pounds i don't know if that's going to help you sir unless it's really good weight unless you reshaped your body a little bit but i mean at the end of the day man recruiting rankings are a great baseline to work off of a baseline understanding but it matters what you do when you get into the program obviously right so Mm -hmm. it's kind of where we are with rocco he's got a lot to prove i hope he has a great spring i hope he challenges i really do i hope he does we had a question so i said that i'm ron burgundy (laughs) somebody in the chat asked this question who's brick Who's brick? Uh, Vince. <laughs> Vince is probably brick. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Vince. I know Vince is listening. He's gonna be so mad at me. <laughs> but I just had to. I had to. So, I, I was. I was. I was. I was thinking it also, but I wanted you yeah. to say it first so you didn't get mad at me. <laughs> All right. Got another from John A. One. John A. John A. One says, "Is it just me, or do the wide receivers look like they're running faster in these released?" practice clips as well as talking about earlier brian like that this was john that said it and yeah it does john because i think again we talked about it one they're all very talented and athletic right like that's a baseline but two i think you are seeing a bit a better a, a, a more consistent and higher profile ability to develop these wide receivers yes. and make them confidence and when they play confidence People play fast. Even guys that aren't fast, if they're confident, though, they look a lot faster than they are on the football field. Luckily, Notre Dame has a lot of speed at wide receiver, a lot of talent at wide receiver, and they're starting to all play really confident, which yes. is a great sign to see. Yes. Great sign. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, Vince, Vince, sorry, I'm still <laughs> laughing at Vince. Vince is like, careful when I start talking about that. And he goes, mean, just mean. Um, <laughs> But uh, we need Vince. We're gonna have to have you lay low for a while because I think you might be wanted for murder. <laughs> the scene he stabs the guy in the heart with the trident. Uh, such a great movie. One of the few I don't like a lot of Will Ferrell's movies. To be honest yeah. with you, I think it's kind of they're all kind of the same. And he's kind of dumb. It's, that one is really funny. The second one was one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. I, I turned it off Anch- like half an hour into the movie. It was bad. I, I haven't seen Anchorman in like 10 years, man. I need to go yeah, watch it's, again, it's honestly. It's, it's a great a, movie. It's a great flick. It's a great flick. It really is. It really is. All right, let's get to some more questions here. We got one from Quinn Kibler. Quinn's question. Brian, can you break down Sam Hartman's throwing motion? It looks like he gets pretty tall and comes almost all the way over the top. Also notice he also almost gets all his toe, the uh, tip of his toes. I don't think he gets on the tip of his toes all the time. I think there's some throws that he does that. I think part of that is just he had to develop that at wake because he's so many times he's thrown the ball right near the offensive lineman because of that slow mesh. He had to get high. He did that a lot on film at wake. He'd have to get high and kind of get it over the top. Uh, I like his over. He's got, uh, he, he brings it low 
and then he brings it over the top. It's almost like Vince said it's like a baseball catcher, you know, like Steve. Well, Steve Spurs like a baseball catcher. Uh, he's like a shortstop, you know, where he gets here and it's over here, almost like a pitcher. And um, sorry, I was getting my references because we were talking about how different it was, like how much Steve Spur would have hated Sam Hartman's throwing motion because he he's here and then he's he brings drops it down and and he's yeah. over the top. Spurrier taught that, you know, here, that from the ear, that whole thing, like a shortstop. But, yeah, can I break it down? It's fine. It works. I have no problem with it. You know, he's a guy that throws from the chest as a set of up here, and he, he has a nice, clean motion. It's very compact, uh, very quick, and he's repeatable. That's really all I care about it. You know, it's a pretty normal throwing motion. That has nothing to do – what you're talking about, though – his pretty tall and the tip of his toes. None of that has to do with the throwing motion. That's body that posture. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that was a little bit of a, that was a little bit of a different, uh, different thing, but yeah, he, he, that was more wake forest than what I've seen from him here. I just, you know, to me, I didn't notice that he was really up on his tippy toes uh, a whole lot, to be honest with you. All right, here we go. Next question is from Notre Dame 2164. I just want to say how excited I am for down the road a little bit ways to get, to have Jadarian Price and Jeremiah Love in the same backfield. The combination of Diggs, Estime, and Tyree is already elite. Yeah. Man. Yeah. It, um, I mean, I don't know if I'd call it elite yet. They still got a little bit more to prove to be elite, but yeah. has the potential to be so. There's well, no that, doubt about that. And that future backfield is going to be completely different, right, Brian? Because it's like, yeah. All you know, es Estime's physical downhill. Diggs can also be physical downhill. He's got a little He's more twitchiness. Pounds, yeah. yeah. Well, 215 plus pound running backs, obviously. They they, they have the power profile to him. Jadarian Price is 203 and lightning in a bottle if he comes back mm -hmm. healthy. Jeremiah Love is going to be six foot and a half. 200, 200, 205 pounds probably when he gets here this fall, and he's going to be lightning in a bottle. Both those players are home run threats. They – they are literally one of those guys that could take it to the house anytime they touch the football, which is exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. No doubt. No doubt. All right, here we go. There's another one. From Rob Osgood. Guys, in previous shows, you talked about making the offense better by having less formations. Please take a minute and describe, meaning more plays out of 11 personnel. Thank you. Yeah. Um, making the O better by having less formations. I've never said that. Um, no, I've said the exact opposite. You talk about making the O better by having less formations. Um, no, I've never said that. What I've said is have less plays out of more. It's the exact opposite. I've said run a bunch of different looks, dump a bunch of different uh, alignments, personnel groupings, mix all that up, and then have fewer plays. So and, and be real and be really good about on those plays, just yes. out of different looks. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it's it's the opposite, Rob. Um, uh, uh, with that. So I, I, what I said was, is I'd have less scheme, less volume of scheme in that regard. And if I said that once and you heard that way, it would, it was a misspeak if I did say that, cause I'm not saying you didn't hear me say that. I'm just saying that's, that's not what I've ever said in regard to uh, the overall point. And if I did say it that way once it was a, it was a misspoke. So um, apologies for that, but yeah, it's definitely, that's uh, definitely, in my opinion, the opposite of what I would say at this point. It's, uh, and I've, I, I was this way as a coach too, Ryan. And that's part of why yeah. I believe it now is less plays, more volume of how you get to those plays. Right. And, and that's what you do. Like, and I've explained different ways we would do that. You know, get real creative with your personnel. It's like when yeah. we talked about, we was explaining the other day where we would put our tight, our running back at tight end, we ran four verts. I mean, it's not a new play. We just got to it and they're not used to that tight end alignment running a vertical. So we put our really fast, you know, 5'11", 215 pound running back there and just have him run right up the field and do that where we would go 21 personnel and, you know, put our running back in the slot, put a receiver at running back and shotgun motion him out. And you know, we ran the same, we ran double posts and with a go field side, we run that all the time. We, we'd practice that a million times. It's just who's running those particular routes, you know? And, right. and so uh, that's where I like to be and it, to me. That's where yeah. I am, especially in college. In college, I want I want kids to be good at a certain amount of things and not overload it too much. But I think that people kind of 
I think they confuse this a little bit, Brian. And like, if you're running the same play out of a different look, it's still consistent with the values that the running back is like, if a running back is really good at inside zone and, you know, let's say inside zone and counter, for instance, right. I can run those things out of multiple formations. It's still the same place. So you still have the same baseline. It's just defensively. Now your pro- their process has to speed up a little bit. Cause they're like, okay, usually I see out of 11 personnel, they're running this type of play. All of a sudden they hear they come out in 21 personnel they're technically running the same run play, but now my eyes have kind of been altered a little bit because you have something completely different in front of me. So it's about maximizing the, the a smaller portion of plays in more looks to kind of keep the defense off balance, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I You know, we, we talk a lot about run. I don't understand where people get certain opinions from. Here, here's one from Brent Smith. Diggs needs perfect blocking to be effective. Price and love will pass him up. I, I just don't understand – where people come up with some of these things and Brent's a good poster. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm sorry, go watch him against Clemson. He doesn't need perfect blocking. First of all, every running back not named Barry Sanders or Walter Payton needs good blocking to be effective. Yeah. It's a thousand percent a fact for everybody. Audric Estime, go look at all of Audric Estime's big runs this year. He's more often not, not getting touched till he's six or seven yards down the field. Half the time against Clemson, you couldn't tell who was in the game. It was Audrick or Logan Diggs. I don't understand where some of this stuff comes from. I really don't. I don't think that's accurate of Logan Diggs at all. I really don't. Logan Diggs is a good football player. So is Audrick yeah. Estime. It's that whole thing again. You know, it's like just – he's it's a good a, football it, player. He's different than Audrick. Audrick's different from him. Chris Tyree's different from him. And Jadarian's different from him. You know, they're different players. But oh, Logan yeah. Diggs didn't do what he did last year because blocking was perfect every time he got the ball. When when Audric was fumbling the ball away against UNLV and they had to ride Logan the rest of the game, that wasn't because of perfect blocking. He was making great plays. He made a great read on that touchdown run. The blocking was good, but he made a great read on it and cut back on it. So, uh, you know, Logan's good football. They're loaded at running back. Absolutely yes. loaded at running back. They There's are. no doubt about it. Let's get to some more. But, but it's still only as good as your offensive line is up front to your point. Always. Right? That's true yes. for every, again, there's two running backs that I've seen in my life where that wasn't true of. And that's Barry Sanders and Walter Payton. Because Walter Payton would rush for a bunch of yards with bad offensive lines because he just bounced it off dudes. Barry Sanders just had the sickest cutting ability in the planet. Yeah. But everybody else is uh, Terrell Davis will tell you, why are you in the Hall of Fame? And great, great offensive lines, great run scheme. Right. I mean, yeah, he was talented. You put some bum back there and he makes the Hall of Fame, but it's completely dependent upon your blocking. That's true for that's true for Audric Estime. Yeah. You know, so um I, I just yeah, I, I don't I don't get that sometimes. I, I really don't. It, it's we've always, seen we've we've seen a lot of good running backs get wasted in the NFL with behind some bad offensive lines, yeah. too. Because I mean, they it, just they can't do it all themselves. Just why did Audric themselves. Estime have nine carries for 20? Well, first two games of the year, Audric against Marshall Ohio State, Audric Estime had 54 carries on 19 or 54 yards on 19 carries. He had 76 yards on 18 carries for 4.2 against Cal. Those are the times of the year when guess what? The offensive line wasn't very good. Picked up against Carolina and then he's seven, eight, nine, six, nine, seven, one, five, seven, six, two, five, eight, all that type of stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't get it. I really don't get it. Yeah. But. That is what it is. He's good back. And I appreciate you, Brent. I just happen to disagree with you on this particular topic. I'm going to ask you this one, Ryan, because it's yep. kind of more uh, your, uh, up your alley, and I'm curious what you thought. Rob Osgood also asked, what is Sam Hartman's NFL comp? Man, that's so tough. Uh, what is Sam Hartman's NFL comp? So Body, body type and throwing motion for me is very okay. Drew Brees-esque. You know, height-wise yeah. and the type of uh, throwing motion – and yeah. su- and height is that's all I compared him to. It's sure. very because Drew had a very high release as well. Like yep. he had that same dip over top release, so very similar to that. And then height wise, very similar to that. I guess my question to Rob would be: Are you asking me for a stylistic comp? Or are you asking me for a a what I think he will end up type like a a, a level of player both. that he'll end up being? Do both. Do both. Okay. Man, it's so tough, man. I, I don't I really have a great I one for this. Type of throwing motion, yeah. you know. So, so to me, I think I think 
honestly, a guy that I think he's similar to style of play wise, Ryan, is a guy that's already in the NFL and is going to start for the commanders this year. Sam Howell. Mike, Short Mike guy, really Mike good Stein. downfield passer, you know, um, sometimes can be a little inaccurate on some of the shorter stuff. Yeah. Great deep ball. I think Sam Hartman became a better run, was a better runner out of necessity, a little better, stronger athlete. But I'd say Sam Hartman's probably, or Sam uh, Howell's probably the closest comp that I, I could have. That's not bad. There's not a lot. There's not a current NFL. There's not, I don't know if there's anybody else that I would say is similar. To yeah. It's kind of mind. like that. It's it's kind of like the new style of RPO heavy quarterback. that's kind of yeah. coming into the NFL, you know, like it's where side where height isn't necessarily the biggest conversation piece. It's more about just kind of the quick release, getting the ball out accurately, throwing the ball deep downfield a little bit occasionally. Like, yeah, so I guess Sam Howell would be an interesting one. I really don't have a great one for that, though, Rob. That's a, good, that's yeah. a really good I think question. Career wise, he reminds me a lot. I could see him a lot like um I don't say I don't say Chase Daniel because I think he could do more in the NFL than Chase Daniel. I think he has a better arm than Chase downfield arm than Chase Daniel. I'm trying maybe, to think maybe of Ryan Fitzpatrick. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I think that's a good one. Yeah. You know, where he'll start for you and do some things and put up some stats, but you're just always wanting to find that next better guy. Yeah. It's because he doesn't like, have like, the ideal traits. Yeah, like I ideally a high end, high end number two quarterback that can start if he needs to type of yeah. situation, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yep. Here we go. Let's get this. There's some good. That was a good question. I, I'm. I was, was curious to get your opinion on that one. It was. It was very thought provoking, Rob. It was yeah. a really good question. Yeah. And uh, last one from Rob, I believe. Here we go. He said, "Hypothetical question: If the passing game opens up like it should, will the running game have more yards as well due to the D being forced?" To cover the whole field, I'd say that the r- yards per carry average will go up, yeah. Rob. Absolutely, I, I do think their overall rushing numbers will improve from where they ended last year, which is one eighty nine point one. But that one eighty nine point one was because they were really bad in the first three games. And so, if you, if like for example, Ryan, if you look at last year's first three games, Notre Dame in the first three games only averaged. 117.7 rushing yards per game. Yeah. Right. Like that, that's not, that's obviously not, that's not good. Right. Not ideal. Not but, ideal. Yeah, yeah. It's not ideal. But if you take out uh, those first three games and you just look at the last 10, they were at 210.5. I think I could see them close to that type of success like they were after that rough start. But as you said, I think 210 to 220 is where I think I can see this offense being at the end of the year. But it, it'll be on fewer carries, to your point. It'll yeah. be, you know, last year, I think they were like 4-8, or were they like 4-8 last year, 4-6 last year. You know, that's not that's not a great yards per – and part of that is because they had to grind because, no, you know, nobody respected their, their pass game at all. I, I really, I, truly feel that they're going to be closer to 5-4, 5-5 this year, which puts them in the top 10 in the country in yards per attempt. That's, yeah. that's where I see them, Ryan. I, I think I think it can definitely happen. I would love to know, Brian. I'm sure that Pro Football Focus probably has the statistic, but I would love to know how many eight and nine man boxes Notre Dame ran into last oh, year. Oh yeah, like, I would but, love to yes. know that stat. I would really love to yes. know that. Yes, yes. I mean, and their their yards per attempt took a half yard jump from where it was the year before, at four point one. You know, yeah. but even the year they went to the playoff in 2020, they were at five point oh two. They were point four point four in 2018. They had to grind out yards. And then you look at 2017 and they were 6.3, you know, and then in 2015, they were 5.6. I mean, they were much, even the 2012 offense was, which was not an explosive offense was four, nine, you know? So, I mean, those 15 and 17 run games were just really explosive and dynamic. And I think a big part of that was they had perimeter threats both years and 15, it was the perimeter threat of the pass. Yeah. Right. And Deshaun could keep the ball and run. That helped as well. You had a quarterback that can make plays with his legs. That helped. But you also had the perimeter. You had to, if you loaded the box against Notre Dame 2015, you were basically just conceding a touchdown to Will Fuller. I mean, it, this is, you're right. I mean, that's kind of pretty much what it was. And the teams that thought that, hey, we have a Dory Jackson, we can, we can run with Will Fuller, realized, no, you can't. And it took <laughs> one whole play to figure that out an 80 yard touchdown. The point being is you had something to scare teams away from your run game. 2017, they weren't a great passing team, but they were teams were scared to death of Brandon Wimbush getting on the perimeter, and they were scared to death of Brandon Wimbush throwing the ball over their head. 
That's what mm-hmm. teams were afraid of. So you had something, even though it wasn't a pretty passing attack, you had something that scared you with your quarterback position. Sure. Last year, once Tyler went down, and even really early on, because Ohio State and Marshall were like, we're going to make Tyler Buckner beat us, and he couldn't, right? South Carolina tried that, and he could. But you look at you look at it this the whole year last year, there was no threat of to the to the to defenses outside the run game. No, teams were daring Notre Dame to throw the football. Navy was getting thrown on. They still didn't change what they were doing. They still didn't try to stop the run. Or to, to, they said, we're still not going to let you run the football. You can try and pass us because we don't think when push comes to shove, Drew Pine can play this way for 60 minutes. And guess what? He couldn't. Yeah. I mean, teams would dare Notre Dame to throw the football last year, and they wouldn't. And a couple times they did. He had some. He had a couple nice games, but overall, just he would miss easy reads, easy throws. You know, I, somebody sent me an article the other day of somebody saying, well, you know, Drew Pine can't throw the ball to himself. I don't ask him to. I'm just asking him to throw to the freaking wide open receivers that we saw every game in the last two months of the season. Uh, you know, how like, many how, how many balls were in the dirt last year on just like slide routes, Brian? Yes. We were just like, guys, yes. guys. <laughs> like anyone that has that opinion, just I don't know what they were watching. Like, were you? Yeah. did you actually not watch Notre Dame last year? Did you only watch them on TV? Because I see Brayden and Lindsey getting open for touchdowns almost every game. Yeah. Right? I don't – hey, he can't throw it to himself. Hey, I'm not asking you to throw it to yourself. I'm just asking you to hit the wide open guy. That's it. Yep. That's it. Everything was so – everything was just so much harder than it had to be in the passing game last year too, Brian. Like even think about – was it was it Navy or Syracuse where Braden toasted that defensive back and he had to come back and make that silly catch? Was that Navy? I, I can't remember. Yes. It, yes, was, it was Navy, Navy. yeah. I mean, he, he – I mean that that should have been a walk in touchdown, and even that play, you're just like you made that so much harder than it had to be, man. And then Brayden had to end up making a just a stupid, ridiculous catch coming back to the football. Everything passing game wise was just so hard last year, man. Like it was just way too difficult. You have mm-hmm. to make the easy things easy. You have to keep it easy. It just wasn't easy last year at all. Yep, agree, agree. Here we go from Andre Tonsil. Question is, every position should be open for competition. The best player should play. What do you think? I think the second part's true, but the first part's not always realistically true. I mean, the reality is, is you can say all you want, the left tackle job is open, but it's not. I mean, Joe Walt's an All-American, and, you know, like, the only time it should be open is if Joe Walt, like, spent the whole offseason, like, drinking and hanging out at the beach and not working out, and then he comes in at 350 pounds and he can't move, get in a stance. Okay, sure, it's an open competition. But we all know that's not what happened with Joe Walt. That's why he was an All-American last year, because he is putting yeah. in the work. So in those rare cases, I mean, we can tell we want, but the tackles are not. That's not an open job. No. That doesn't mean that 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 you – here's the thing. You, you, you find those things, and you have to be realistic, because kids aren't stupid. Yes. And you can sit Joe Walt down and say, Joe, listen. I, you know, if, if Joe Rudolph could sit Joe Walt down and say, listen, I'm a first-year coach, and I don't care what you did last year. Every job is open. You could do that, and that's silly. It's a waste of your time, because – Everybody knows. We say, hey, Joe, look, man, you're a great player, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to push you every single day to make you even better. Yeah. But I'm also going to challenge you to do something else. You may be gone in a year or two. What legacy are you leaving behind you? I need you to help me with those young kids. If I'm over here coaching somebody else and you watch a rep and you see a meal do something or you see somebody do something, I, I need you to show some leadership. Those are the ways you challenge kids like that. Right. Find something else for them to focus on besides like competing for a job because we all know he's he's going to start. We all know Blake Fisher's going to, and I would do the same thing with Blake Fisher, right? That I did with Joe Walt. It's like, hey, you, um, we I could sit here and tell you that I'm going to make your job open for someone to battle, but I, we're wasting time. We're not children here. Yes. Here's the deal, though. I expect greatness from you, and I'm going to ride you every single day until I get greatness from you. That's the challenge. Not hey, it's open competition. Most other positions, it's yeah, sure, it's an open competition. Yeah, in a lot of places. But you, you have to be careful with that too because it's really not. Like when Jalen – going in 2015, was Jalen Smith actually an open competition? No. It, so so what do you do to challenge him to get the most out of him? Because there is a level of if guys just know it's their job and there's no challenge and they can just go out and practice and half-butt it and not focus and have bad practices and then just, okay, well, he's an All-American, whatever, then your team's going to stink, Yeah. right? There needs to be some level of challenge, and it's it, a lot of coaches have this. Like, if I'm hard on my best guy, then everybody knows you better bring it today. Because if I'm ripping Joe Walton practice today, or I'm getting on Blake Fisher today, or if I'm Mike Mickens and I'm all over Benjamin Morrison in practice today, 
You know, I'm ripping J.D. Bertrand's butt up and down the field today for the way he practiced today. You know, I, I, I'm all over Audric for what he brought to the table today. Man, he's ripping the dudes, right? Like, no, I know I got to bring it. Nobody right? safe. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a big thing that I heard from a lot of people during Charlie Weiss's era is, like, Golden would just kind of act a certain way, and Charlie would just let it go. And if somebody else acted that way, oh, it's got to be the opposite. You got to yeah. hold your studs to the highest standard. And the great ones don't need you to do that. They do it to themselves. That's what made Quentin Nelson such a great player and a great leader yep. is he was he was going to bring it every day. I, I've said this before. I remember talking to Alex Bars, and he was like, you knew every day. It could be a Tuesday in the middle of getting ready for whatever bum team. He didn't say bum team. That's my t play on what he said. And you just knew you had to bring it that day because you knew Quentin was. And if you didn't bring it, Quentin was going to let you know about it. Yeah. That's what greatness is. It wasn't, hey, Quentin, your job's open for – no. So, But to your point, Andre, a lot of positions should be open in the, in the, from the standpoint of not that it's an – hey, it's, it's an open competition again, but it's, hey, you may be the starter, but that's only as long as you're still the best guy at that position. Right. And it's not because you were the starter last year. It's not, a, it's not seniority. It's a meritocracy, in my opinion. It's based on what you've done and what you're doing. And what you've earned. And to me, that means sometimes starters get beat out. Flat out. Linebacker should be an open competition. No question. Uh, safety should be a competition to a degree. Uh, the guard positions are open. The receiver positions are open. The running back position is even open to a degree, in my opinion. It'd be even more open if Jadarian Price was healthy. But in some of those, it's like, do I really need to have that conversation with Benjamin Morrison about it being open or Cam Hart, they know it's not open. Like, right. did I need to have that conversation with Michael Mayer last year? No. So what did Jared Parker do? He didn't say, Hey man, if you don't do, if you don't work hard, you know, I may start Kevin Bauman over you. Hmm, really? Okay. Coach. Like, you know, I'm Michael <laughs> Mayer, right? No, it was, it was this, it's nothing you're doing is good enough. Right. I need better. And, and remember that practice last spring when Mayer talked about that. He's like, man, he's like, you know, it was like when he was hired, he's like, we're watching film and then he's just nitpicking and picking. And I, he's like, Michael's like, man, coach, I thought I had a pretty good year last year. You know, it's like, but that's kind of how it was. And it, what did it do, Ryan? It made him a much better player. Because everything's about competition. You've done. Right. Because even that's competition, Brian. That's Michael right. Mayer versus Michael Mayer, right? Like that's still exactly. a competition, man. You got to play against yourself, you know? Like exactly. it's 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 testing it's you versus the standard. That's right, the exactly. It's testing your limitations as a player, too. Because Michael Mayer could have easily just like settled on his merits and been like, I'm an all-American, man. Like, I already have my place in Notre Dame history. Nah, man, it's not good enough. It's not good yeah. enough. You still have more that you can get to. So even that's a competition. It might not be yeah. a competition of one person versus the other, but it's a competition against yourself and against your limits at the end of the day. So everything should be a competition in that regard. I agree yes. 100 percent Yes. And so you got to find what does he really need to compete about against to make him some guys need to be pushed for their job. Some guys get really complacent. I'm the starter. I think yeah. of the movie program. Some people say one of the best scenes was when Latimer gets start and he goes out and he's like bangs his head through. It. And I'm like, that was a terrible scene for me. It's like that guy had reached his goal. His goal was simply to start. Yep. I don't care about that. Like starting is like, yeah, okay, now what are you going to do? You know, like, and, and to me, that's sort of the difference between the great ones and the others. Some guys are like, okay, I'm, I'm here now. Now it's time to really go to work. Now it's time for me to really show something. And as long as you have a guy like that, it's not an open competition. It's really not. So what do you do, Ryan, to find ways to motivate that guy to be better? Yeah, as a yeah. freshman All American last year, I don't care. Freshman, you weren't a, you want another normal All American. You're a freshman All American. Most freshman corners don't play that much, so you won by default. I mean, I wouldn't say that, but you know, you know, just find the things to motivate those guys and get them to strive for greatness. And that's yeah. what you do. And the great ones don't really need that much of a push, to be honest with you. Yep. It's just finding that. But what kind of message did Derek Parker send to Michael Mayer? Hey, man, it, yeah, you were good, but you can be better. Yes. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm here to coach you. I'm not here to be your buddy. I'm here to tell you how great you are. I'm here to make you the best you can be. That's and my I, job. And I also love that about Jared Parker, too, Brian, because it'd yeah. I mean, be easy for a tight end coach to go in last year and been like, 
I got Michael Mayer, man. I could coast here a little bit, you know what I mean? Like I don't yeah. have to really push that much, but I mean, I think that that's, again, that's where that competition comes from both sides, man. Jared Parker dared him to be better than he was. Yeah. And Michael Mayer took the, took the opportunity and ran with it. Yes, absolutely. And he did. And he, and he yeah. took that coaching and that's really the big key, Ryan. That's the big key for me. No doubt. I mean, by the way, Andre, this is a great point. I think your question was good. It's just, I think that it, it sparked a lot of conversation and I think those kind of things are really good. It's just be clear about what competition should be in my yep. opinion. I agree. From Tyler Smith. He says, is it wrong that I'm going to miss my friend's wedding for the Notre Dame Ohio versus Ohio State game? I told him he was rude and scared Ohio State was going to have problems. So is he an Ohio State fan? Then yeah, I mean, yeah, you shouldn't be. I mean, look, I probably would have done the same thing when I was younger. I'm not gonna lie. Like, I mean, if you're my friend and we're that close, then you, you why would you schedule a wedding and a weekend in the fall anyway? You know what I mean? Like, I'm sorry, you're being you're being selfish. I'm kidding, obviously, with the being selfish thing. But yeah, it's like, hey man, I'm sorry. I, I got I got tickets in Notre Dame game. Oh, you going to the game? No, I got tickets in my couch and I'm gonna be sitting there eating nachos and yeah. <laughs> So, uh, no, I, I get it. I guess it depend on how close a friend you are. Yeah. You know, if, if he's like, like, the, be- if he's yeah, like the best I'm, man or something. Yeah, if, I, if I'm sitting in the audience with a bunch of other people, sorry, bro. I hope it was great. I'll catch the DVD. You can you stream know? it. But you if, can stream it nowadays. If I'm in the wedding party, you know what I would have done, Ryan, especially nowadays? I'm up there up front. And I got my phone in my hand and I'm watching yes. the game during the wedding. I just have to make sure the sound is off. Because once you walk up there, I mean, they don't need you to talk or do anything. You don't got to really pay attention. Yeah. You know, you just want to get it out there. Yeah, wrong. Once so. you see one wedding, you've seen them all, man. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, like I've you said, like you said, if he, was, if he was if he was a great friend too, he would just stream the wedding so that everybody right. could see it if they can't get right. out there anyway. So right. Yeah. Yeah. Or he wouldn't have scheduled it the weekend learning plays Ohio State. It's <laughs> very true. What's happening during the Tennessee State game? game? Come on, man. Yeah, right. Like maybe. Okay, <laughs> Navy. All right, cool. I can't be at that when it's in Ireland. Okay, no big deal. But uh, Ohio State game? Come on, man. Come right. on, man. All right, here's another one from Quinn Kelly. From <laughs> Quinn so Kelly. Right now with our, with our comments about <laughs> weddings. If one of our friends would have said that to us, we'd have been so mad. Seriously. So mad. But that's why. But I got married in April, Ryan. I wasn't, you know, I didn't get married in the fall. I got married in June. So, yeah. So, even we better. Were, yeah, even man. Better. Yeah. yeah. Quinn Kelly's question Can you explain different linebacker terminology in some players who would fit each one? Example, Will for Nolan Siegler. Yeah. I mean, so the three Notre Dame positions, Quinn, are Mike linebacker, Will linebacker, and then they have a rover. Okay. So, Mike linebacker, middle linebacker, right? He's the middle of the defense. In a 4-2-5, he's the strong side inside linebacker to the strong side of the play, okay? So some characteristics that you're talking about that type of player, they're usually more of a downhill player, a little bit more physical. They have to sort through traffic well. They have to be – they have to play with a little bit more of a pop in the lower half at the point of attack. They got to play with good ability to stack and then disengage, Will linebackers are on the weak side inside linebacker in a 4-2-5 alignment, the weak side of the play. Those guys, you'll hear me talk about pursuits a lot for those players. They usually have to deal with a little bit more space on the backside of a play. They usually don't have to fight through as much contact as Mike linebackers. Still have the ability to get downhill, but more than anything, they need to be a little bit twitchier of athletes usually, kind of cover a little bit more ground. And they also have to be a little better in pass coverage than traditionally what a Mike linebacker is going to be because they're going to be, you know, backside seams, backside overs, a bunch of different stuff. They really have to find their landmarks effectively. The Rover in a 4 2 5, what? So if it was a 4 3 alignment, because Notre Dame plays a lot of 4 3 personnel out of their 4 2 5 look, the Rover is just what, what traditionally would be a Sam linebacker. Just what's happening now with this Rover position playing in space is it's becoming more of a hybrid position. So it's not your traditional Sam line. I mean, Sam linebackers back in the day used to be long, like 6'3", decent length, 250-plus pounds, because typically those guys would play on the strong side of the play, but then they would also play on the line of scrimmage a little bit in some under-over fronts. 
Not as much what you see in today's game. So 425 Rover is a guy that has some characteristics of a linebacker, also have characteristics of a safety. So a guy that can play in space a little bit better, but also a guy that can come up and still be able to play on the front side of runs, still be physical, and still be able to be a little bit of that force player. But it's just kind of the evolution of the game that that 425 has turned the Sam linebacker into a more, little bit more of a space player as the rover position. Ryan, there's a great response from Father David, who's one of uh, our one of our OGs as well. But uh, he's a priest, and uh, he had this response to the marriage thing. I perform the weddings, and I wouldn't go. <laughs> you want me to marry you? No chance you schedule it during a Notre Dame game. <laughs> That's such a great response. I love that guy. I love that guy. Oh, my goodness gracious. That That's was, so that funny. Was great. So that funny. was absolutely great. Great, great, great response. Great response. All right, let's get let's get to some more here. Next question is from Sean Higgins, who says, what's the latest on Tyson Ford? Feel like no one's talking about him, making an impact this year. Is he behind where you thought he'd be coming out of high school? Uh, a little bit, yeah, if I'm being honest, a little bit. I, I think so. Um, I think Tyler's had a tough time adjusting to – just like I said, he's we talked about this a little bit the other day. He was so much bigger and more talented than everybody played against that I don't think he really understands what it takes to really get the most out of himself. And he's got to learn that. And then it's up to the coaches to push him to get that out of him. So as far as this year, it's like we've seen two practices and we've seen him going through drills. He looked okay today. I mean, he's big. He's he's definitely an interior guy now. Like and he, I don't know if all the weight's necessarily good weight. I think he's still reshaping his body a little bit but yeah he's got a he's got a lot to learn still he's got a lot to learn so i'm hoping the light goes on for him and and honestly it's not just about him it can't always be on the 18 19 year old the coaches need to be part of that process too oh. and i just say hey man if you don't step up you're out of here like that's not motivation that's just laziness yeah. it's about hey man i need you to be great and you can be great so i'm gonna ride you every single day until you get there and if a kid doesn't want that, then he's not a champion, and you move on. If a kid embraces that, then you got yourself a dude. You're, and, and now whether the light goes on this year or next year, you're going to have yourself a player. And I don't know what guy Tyler is because he's still young. And we'll find that out over these next couple years, assuming that that message is delivered. Because what, what we see it sadly a lot now in today's era of transfer portal and younger guys playing, a lot of coaches give up on guys. They Some coaches yeah. treat it like the NFL. And the NFL – it's not my job to coach you up like I did, like you do in college. You got to have a basic level of understanding of what you're doing here. Yep. And then I'm going to teach you the scheme and all that kind of stuff. And so that's how the NFL is. College cannot be that way. If you're that way as a college coach, find a different, something different to do with your life. It, you've got to be someone that says, hey, if this kid is, as long as this kid is coachable, I'm going to work with him. And that's something I think Mike Elson did a great job of. It's something I think Mike Mickens does a great, great job of. It's something that the the Harry Heastan did a great job with. The best coaches can do that. Can Al Washington be that guy? We'll find out. But I hope he's not one of those guys that just writes guys off if they're not if they can't help him right now. And and that's just that's not where you need to be. Coach yeah. him up. If he's got talent and he's got something to work with, it's your job to push him. And then if he doesn't want to be coached, that's when you say, "Hey, man, you know, I tried pushing you, and you." pouted and did i'm this is i'm not speaking about tyson anymore i'm just speaking in general i was i demanded a lot of you i pushed you and you just you got mad every time and pouted and you know you don't want to be coached so i'm moving on to somebody that does and that's when i'm okay moving on from a guy if a guy doesn't want to be coached yeah. doesn't want to be better then you're wasting your time go find something else to do but i and i don't know which i don't know what tyson is at that point in time so I I hope he takes a step forward, man, because it's hard to teach some of the tools that he has at near six foot four, 292 pounds now, right? Like he's a gifted talent on the defensive line. But, you know, at the end of the day, man, it only matters what you put on film every day, right? So got to see as he matures. Yep, absolutely. Here's a here's one from Paulie G. His question is, I feel Chris Tyree is, so, is going to have a break at year because he's working with the receivers and running backs. Do you agree with this? Chris Tyree will have a breakout year the minute the head foot the football coaches at Notre Dame realize how what he can bring to the table and allow him to have a breakout year. 
That's yep. and, 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 and essentially he's, gotta stay, healthy. he's yeah. gotta stay healthy, right? But last year, with a few few exceptions, a few exceptions, the coaching staff just said, Here's what we're doing, and you got to fit into it. Yep. And he it's not who he is. Cal game, North Carolina game, Clemson game, South Carolina to a degree. They said, okay, we're going to do what you do. We're going to let you do what you do. And he did well. He made plays. And, and in the South Carolina game, his numbers weren't good, but they were, we said this before, he was so, they were so afraid of Chris Tyree. He was impactful. And every time he went into motion, yeah. they did something to react to it that Notre Dame took advantage of. And so he was still impactful, even though his numbers weren't there. It's like a great basketball player that just constantly draws double teams. So he only finishes with like 12 points, but he had like 13 assists because he just kept, you know, dishing it out to the shooters and they're knocking down wide open jump shots because they're so afraid of him. He may have gone like, you know, five of 15 and hit a couple free throws and doesn't look like a normal great night, didn't get to his 25 points per game, but he impacted the game in a big way because he draw, drew so much attention that he then opened up opportunities for everybody else. And that's kind of what Chris did in the bowl game. If they start using him consistently where he's getting the ball, then what do teams do? Now exactly. what do you do? You know, um, yeah, it, it, yes, I believe it's possible, Paulie. It's just whether or not he can. He's and now he's got to stay healthy. Chris got banged up a couple times the last couple of years. That that's that's a fact. But if, as long as he's healthy, it's about use him, use him. We never said once last year Chris Tyree needs to be the lead back. What we said was, however, Chris Tyree needs to play and be used the right way and get touches in a lot of different ways. That's what we said, yep. and they didn't do that, and it was a mistake in my opinion. Yep. But they have a chance to make up for it. They do. So we'll see. That's potentially two more years of that if, if he's if he's happy and he wants yeah. to stay. Yeah. Question from Andre Tonsil says question for Brian. Who is the best player we don't know yet? Who's the well, it depends. Uh, see, I here's my hope, Aunt Andre. My hope is that I can't find an answer because we've done such a job of in, of of creating the type of community here, or we've had the type of people that join this community that you know the team, you know the roster, you know what who the guys are. So if I were to say to you, guy that you don't know of, and I was to, na to name like, you know, Ty Chan at guard or Jason Onye at D-tackle, you'd Andre, you'd be like, no, I know that dude. Who else? Uh, Chance Sucker Corner. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, I know him. Who? Uh, I, I got nothing for you, man, like a walk-on freshman that no one's ever heard of because you already know this team. So let me take a look at it from a different angle. Let me look at it from this angle, Ryan. There's a couple guys that I think the college football world doesn't really know about yet, and they yeah. will this season. Uh, Xavier Watts is one for me on defense. Um, I think he's a guy. I'm really got my eye on Jason Onye as, as being a guy that if he can crack that too deep and force his way into the too deep could really help solidify some things inside with Gabriel Rubio, who's, who's really filling out like he's a legit 300-plus pound guy now. On, on offense, I think Chris Tyree is a good answer, but I feel like he's kind of already a known commodity with people. But Billy Shrouth is a guy for me, and the tight ends. I, I don't. I, I mean, look, ESPN wrote an, a, a replacing Michael Mayer article, and they didn't even talk about Mitchell Evans. They, they talked more about Jaden Greathouse and Preston Zinter than Mitchell Evans. I think that's going to change this season. I think everybody's going to know who Mitchell Evans is and Holden Stace. They're going to know both yeah. of those guys, but Holden Stace was at least kind of a highly ranked recruit. He was a top 200 guy. The, everybody's going to know who Mitchell Evans is. And we don't talk a lot about Mitchell Evans, but we're going to know who Mitchell Evans is by the end of the season. The whole college football world is going to know like, Oh, Notre Dame's got another good one coming down the pike. Matter of fact, they got a couple good ones coming down the pike. You know what yeah. I mean? So uh, yeah, that um, those would be ones for me that I would look at. I would Ryan, any any to pop in in your mind? Yeah, I have a couple. I'm sorry that 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 question you just highlighted. I yeah, just can't gonna, believe that that's gonna, a take. I can't wait to get to that one. I can't believe that's a yeah, take. we'll, we'll um, get to that one. We'll get to that one. Yeah, Jordan Batelho is one on defense for me. That's a guy. Uh, I think that with the with Fossey out of the room and with him yeah. assuming a potential starter role, I think that he has a chance to put up some nice statistics and really yeah. get onto that radar. So cool. he's one for sure. Offensively, I mean, Mitchell Evans is a great one. The tight end position was honestly the first one that was on the forefront of my mind. I think Billy Strauss a good answer as well. Everybody else is kind of a known commodity. Like, you know the two running backs. You know who Sam Hartman is, obviously. 
you know, maybe from a national media perspective, maybe Deion Colsey's a guy that might be fit that conversation, you know, or what'd you say? Sorry. Nationally, how about Cam? Cam. Wait, which Cam? Hart. Cam Hart? Uh, Is there another Cam on the team now? Yeah, I, I, that's why I was confused because I, I was talking about offense. So that's why oh, I was a little you. like, oh, well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, know Notre Dame, I know NFL scouts know about Cam, but do you think people yeah. at ESPN have spent a lot of time talking about Cam Hart? Probably You never hear him talk about during broadcasts. That's I'll true. bet you that changes if he stays healthy this season. Yeah, Cam Carm- Hart's a good one. I think you hit Xavier Watts. That's another good one. Defensively, I think there's a lot more easy ones, Brian, because I think offensively, like you know a lot of those guys, right? Like Sam Hart. And they were the most more highly ranked recruits, Ryan. That's the thing. It's like yeah. Lorenzo Stouts was a top under recruit. Deion was a top under recruit. Tobias was a top under recruit. Yeah. You know, Audrey Estime was a top 200 recruit. I mean, these guys were known commodities. Logan Diggs is already broken out. You know, Audrey's already broken out. They had the great one two punch in the bowl game. So, yep. A lot of those guys, we already know who they are. You know, they were high. It's now it's like, oh, finally, so and so is doing what he was supposed to be doing his whole career. Yep. Okay. I mean, I hope I hope Nolan Ziegler or Jalen Sneed are those guys on defense too, hopefully. But yeah. we'll see. We'll Absolutely. see. Absolutely. And Josh Burnham. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Question from David Prevo. Do you think there will be more of a rotation for some defensive backs this year? There was some due to injury last year, but would love to see guys stay fresh against spread teams or guys are ready. I don't think the the uh, rotation last year had anything to do with injuries. I mean, they played three, cor- four corners all season. Yeah. All season. I mean, they played Cam, actually five, but four definite series. I mean, Jaden Mickey would play, but he didn't always play. But every game that they were healthy, they played Cam Hart, Benjamin Morrison, Clarence Lewis, and Tariq Bracey. Every yep. game. So they played four guys. And on safety, they played a four-man rotation all year. So it just – who was in that rotation changed when, like, Brandon Joseph got hurt. But they played – I mean, Houston Griffith played a ton last year. DJ Brown played a ton last year. And then finally, eventually, Ramon and, and Xavier got more snaps. So, I mean, five guys got a lot of snaps at safety last year because of the injury, but they were a four-man rotation. I, I, I'll i say this, David, maybe we see a little bit more at certain positions. Like, I think we could see if Chance Tucker can really pop like I hope he can, maybe they can spell Benjamin Morrison for a few series a game, a couple series a game, and take some of that wear and tear off him and make, keep, like you said, keep him fresh. That's a great idea. But I think that, they would ideally like to do that anyway. I think that's the one DB position we didn't see a lot of rotating last year, Ryan, yeah. is because there was nobody else who could really play the boundary like Benjamin could. They tried it early in the year, and every time teams would see Benjamin off the field and Clarence losing the boundary, they'd go right at him. Yep. And he's just not a boundary corner. So they just did it less and less and less as Benjamin got better and better and better. So, But this year, hopefully, they can find something that can take 10 to 12 snaps off his legs a game. Yep. And so then by the end of the year, you've taken about a hundred snaps off of, off of his plate and he's pretty healthy in, in, in late, so late October and November when you start really getting into some big time money game situations. I think it's safety. It's a little, it's going to be a little tough right now. I mean, I think that's why we keep talking about like Clarence Lewis or someone like that moving to safety right now, because I mean, right now you have Ramon Henderson, Xavier Watson and DJ Brown. Like that's guys that you're really comfortable with. Besides that you have, Two freshmen and one into Don Schuler isn't able to play in spring either, right? So that's going to be a little bit of a limited rotation, in my opinion, unless you get a Clarence Lewis transition to safety or if Ben Miniature or Don Schuler take that step up. But it's just, I mean, right now I see three guys that are definitely going to play in safety. I just don't know if there's a fourth, obviously, in that conversation. Right. It, it may not. Well, Thomas Harper, I think you almost might have to be that guy, which I think yeah. hurts them at nickel, yep. in my opinion. Now we'll see. We'll see how it we'll see how it turns out. Here's here's Brent Smith is back. Brent says Ryan and Brian, who are the two starting guards versus Navy? I I think for me, I I today I would say Billy Shroud and Andrew Kristofik at the other guard. That would be my two answers for it. Yep, I'm there. That's where I'm at. I think if I had to pick today, that'd be my two. My sleeper for that would be uh, Michael Carmody if he can put the weight on. If he can get up to 290 and keep it, he'd be the other one. But at 280, I just don't think he can be that guy. Yeah, it's going to be tough, man. It's going to be tough. Question from Jeff Fluke. Do you think Styles, Lorenzo Styles, look, looking better has anything to do with the trust that the quarterback will make the throw he needs to make compared to last year? I don't think so because early in the year when he was having his struggles, he was catching the ball from Tyler and they were roommates and good friends and, yeah, you know, supposedly had a rapport. 
and he caught balls from Tyler as a freshman. I think it was just, I think, I think, I don't know the answer. I wasn't there. I don't know Lorenzo. The way reading it from an outsider, I think he put a lot of pressure on himself. Yeah. And when things didn't start going well, he pressed number one and then kind of, he then allowed the quarterback stuff to become an excuse yeah. for him is what I think. But Lorenzo was in his own head and I don't think his attitude is where it needed to be. And how do I know that? Okay. When I'm watching a guy in the first two, three games of the year, when he's not the number one read jogging off the ball, disinterested, yeah. that's not a yeah. guy that's got in the right head space. Now, part of that is, well, he knew the ball wasn't coming. All right. That says a lot. That says a lot about you. It says more about you than the quarterbacks. And so that's when I knew Lorenzo wasn't in the right headspace. If he gets back to that, and I think the quarterback play can help. See, here's where the quarterback play can help with that, though, Ryan. When you have a guy like Tyler with what Tyler was in the bowl game or a guy like Sam Hartman, for sure, who's proven it at a much greater level, I don't care where you are in the read. If you're if you're on the field, run your freaking route because I may throw you the ball. Right? So that matters. That matters. And I don't think they always did that in the past. I don't think Ian Book was very good at going past his first couple reads. Drew Pine didn't often have anything past his first two reads. Right. And so guys would just know I'm not getting the ball right here. So I'm just going to jog off the line and not show effort and not occupy the safety because he clearly sees me not trying to run hard. Yeah. If he can fix that, Lorenzo could be a – I mean, we don't talk about him as – that's a guy we don't talk enough about because I think we just kind of wrote him off after last year. Sure. Lorenzo Styles is still a very talented football player. And if his head's if he's in the right headspace this year, he could end up being their leading receiver. I mean, it's not out of the question, right? And that's what makes this receiving course so good. Lorenzo is, Styles, Lorenzo Styles was on the freaks list last year, Brian. Like, I mean, we forget about that, right? Like the kid's a very physically gifted player. Yeah. I agree with you, though. I think that I don't think I don't think Lorenzo was ready to be that guy last year. I don't think he was ready in his mind. It, like, and I just think that he was pressing all year, and then he get it. He hit a very low spot mentally during that season. That's what I believe. I think it's very positive though so far that you're seeing in spring ball that he looks locked in and he looks a lot more confident. That tells me that there might be some resilience to, resiliency yeah. to that kid, which is a great thing to see. Obviously, have to see it in games. Planet but. Ryan. I'm sorry, buddy. I mean, in no, no, you're fine. Your no, I, I was finishing. I was finishing because I was just going to say it's a great sign. Have to see it on on Saturdays, but it's a good sign so far this offseason for sure. He would not be the first kid on the planet to have a bad. There's a reason the expression "sophomore slump" is an is is something we hear about. Hundred percent. You know, because your sophomore slump comes from you did something as a freshman. You're feeling really good about yourself, and for whatever reason, y- it doesn't happen. And for Lorenzo, it started last spring. You know, it, it all started last spring. So to see him stepping up and playing well this spring, sure, yeah. sure. I mean, yeah. But what whether it's Tyler or Sam or whatever, I don't care what the reasons are. Don't care. I just want to get fixed. Because if it gets fixed, Lorenzo is a really because here's the thing: they have such unique skills. You could start a game with three just physical freak, like size freaks on the field, 6'5", 215, Deion Colsey, 6'4", 205, Tobias Merriweather, and your quote-unquote little guy of Jaden Thomas, who's 6'2", 220 in the slot. With 6'6", 250-pound Mitchell Evans, a tight end, or 6'4", 245-pound Holden Stace, a tight end. Okay. All right. Who? What are you going to do? Then the very next uh-huh. series you come out, and you've got freaking Chris Tyree at slot and Lorenzo Styles at the field receiver, and all of a sudden it's like, now what do you do? Now, how do you defend this team? It's and you can throw Caleb Smith into the boundary. Yeah. Like it's just yeah. Yeah. any of the others. I mean, right? But it's that's the thing, Ryan. Is how do you defend that? Yeah. Like that. Honestly, that might be my twelve personnel alignment. Yeah. Instead of going big with twelve personnel, I'm RPing you to RPOing you to death out of twelve personnel. I'm gonna have Lorenzo Styles and Chris Tyree out there, and we're gonna motion and bubble screen you and RPO you and, and now screen you to death. Cause if you think that you're going to crowd the box, like it was, it was so funny. We were at the pro day yesterday and Sam Hartman, like I think I had him like 21 for 21 when they were out from the field. It's just like throwing these gorgeous deep balls. And Sean looks up, Sean's sitting down, Sean Davis sitting down. And I'm looking up. Sean looks at me like this, please, please put eight in the box next year. You know what I mean? Just like, <laughs> I dare you to put, 
but that's the whole thing. Like you can't do that next year. So maybe that's how you mix up your receiver rotation. We go 12 personnel and put Chris Tyree and Lorenzo Styles in the game or Lorenzo and Tobias in the game or whatever, you know, where you're, you're going to get a different skill set. We're going to be physical in the box and fast in the perimeter. Yeah. I and mean, there's all types of different ways to do it. You just got to get creative with it. But if Lorenzo gets his head on straight and Chris Tyree takes to this receiver thing, and if Tobias is who I think he is, and if Dion can be more consistent, you get my point? Yeah. We know what Jaden Thomas and Caleb Smith can do. All of a sudden, how do you defend this team? Well, how do you, you defend this team? You, you know what's the most um, – you know what's the mo- the spot that is so – like we're going to talk about this a lot, I'm sure, this offseason, but the spot that it, it is the biggest headache potentially for a defense next year guarding Notre Dame is that – one snap, if I'm a slot defender and I have to see Jaden Thomas, and then the next snap I see Lorenzo Styles, the next snap I see Chris Tyree, and then by the way, Hold Stace might throw go in there in the slot occasionally. It's like, man, so many different body types and styles on the inside there, especially. Right. It's like it's a headache, man. That's a because headache. Because if to you're deal going with. just between eleven and twelve, and in eleven personnel I'm facing Jaden Thomas, and then twelve personnel I'm facing Holden Stace, it's not that big of a difference. Sure. You're going to be running very similar route trees. Both physically, guys. Right. Yeah. Same yeah. big physical guy. One guy's a little taller, a little longer, and you know, thicker, but it's the same type of game. Yep. Then I come in with this five foot nine, 190 pound guy that runs a four three. <laughs> and yeah. it's like, uh, I can't play you the same way I did last season. No, you can't. You know what I mean? And and so now what do I do? And that's uh, Ryan. You know, I've, we, you and I agree on this. I know for a fact. I love diversity of skills on offense. No doubt. It's like Alabama and that game against Notre Dame was able to kind of be physical on the perimeter with Notre Dame's receivers, and they couldn't do the things they'd done all year, just throwing the one on ones to, you know, Javon McKinley and Ben Skronik. They had, but they had nothing to counter with. Nothing yeah. to counter with. If they took that out, well, oh well, we gave it our best shot. We had a nice run. You know, now it's like, okay, cool. Then we're going to put Lorenzo in there and you motion him a bunch. And now we're going to get you chasing him all day. And yeah. then they're going to come back out in the second half. after you've been chasing Lorenzo and Chris Tyree for a couple quarters. And then we're going to come back out with Tobias and Dion and Jaden and say, okay, now, now, now we've had you chasing around all day and you're tired. Now we're going to just come out and beat you up. It's a great problem to have. Yes. That's, That's why I've been – Ryan, this is exactly why I complained for years about they needed to bring in more slot types. But once again, poor recruiting has fought, forced you to move a guy that from another position there to save it like we have with safety. But I don't care. You're there. Right. You know? And that's where I want to be. I just – give me different body types, different skill sets. That's what I want to see. That's what I want to see. All right. Here we go. From Eric O'Brien, he said, his question is, what is the difference between an official visit and unofficials other than paying for travel? Eric, we've talked about this a bunch in the past. Um, so usually official visits are multi-day to start. You know, usually unofficials are just usually just a one-day kind of off thing. Official visits are usually multi-day stops over a weekend, usually. But the biggest things is that when you're on an unofficial visit, you're touring the campus very generally, right? You're going out and you're seeing the athletic, the athletic, um, you know, all the athletic. Um, I can't speak right now. All the af- a- all the athletic buildings and and or, uh, stuff that they have there. It's a football related thing. Yes, it's mostly it's, just the stuff related to football. Yeah, those. when you're when you're on an official visit, that's where stuff gets starts getting real from the academic side. So you're touring. That you know, you're touring the academic facilities. You're going into the classrooms. You're going in to talk to um, to the a- academic advisors. You're going to go tour the dorms and really see what that's like structurally on the inside and all that type of stuff. So, basically, again, just to summarize, unofficial. It's a very athletic department driven. It's usually a one day off type of situation. Official visits, you're getting paid for for the visit. It's usually multi days, and you can also get more into the academic side of that visit type of structure, and then the dorm stuff. So that's some and of the basics. You are starting to see more and more kids go to two day and three day visits on unofficials. Like Logan Thomas is doing that, but a lot of times kids will take these like Midwestern trips where they'll go out for like a week and see like five or six different schools. Yeah, Midwest swing, but, baby. Yeah, yeah. It just it just really comes down to the but the the big thing really is honestly, Eric. The only thing that's fundamentally different 
is the paying for travel and lodging and and all of that is really the primary yeah. difference. It really is. And there, you're limited on how many of those you can have. You only yeah. take five. Five. Yeah. You can take as many unofficial visits as you want. All right. Here's an interesting one, Ryan. From Ryan Haynes, it looks like I think is uh, Haynes. As I'm going to give that a shot. Ryan, great first name. Question: Why doesn't Mickey yeah. just start in the slot and we play Harper as more of a in the box safety? Talk about it's Jamie close. Mickey. It's close to being a great name. It's one letter away. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I don't know if number one is we know that Thomas Harper's a really good nickel guy. We've seen him do it. We don't know if Jaden Mickey's that guy. So right. I think number one is why would you recruit Thomas Harper to move him to a position that he has not excelled in in college? That makes no sense to me. Yeah. Like, I just think that would be a, now it may, you may be forced to do that if something happens somewhere else. But to me, you, you recruited Thomas Harper. Why? Based on what he did at Oklahoma state. Well, what did he do at Oklahoma state? He was a slot guy. Yeah, exactly. And you know, he can do it. I don't know that he can be a good safety. I have no clue. So now you have two guys that are in positions they have not proven that they can be effective in. So that's why, to me, I wouldn't do it. Two unknowns, uh, right, right, right. So you're I talking about put, a guy that you haven't seen in that safety role as much and a guy that you haven't seen in the slot as much on yeah. the college level, obviously, either. So no. just two unknowns. I'm not saying I wouldn't let Jade Mickey learn at the slot. I would. But I'm not moving him there and then moving someone else away, assuming it's going to work out. Right. You know, I just I'm not doing that. But yes, I would like to see Jade Mickey get opportunity in the slot because who's going to start there when Thomas Harper leaves? It's a great question. So yeah, work him there, but I'm not working him there and moving someone else away from it. In my opinion, it's just not what I'm going to do. I agree. We had a super chat from Bayside Tiger Six. Thank you so much for the super chat. Glad to have you guys in on a Saturday and able to join live since 2000. Which Notre Dame players can you think of with more memorable NFL careers than college? David Givens is one for me. Luke Pettigrew, to me. Now, I know he's a first-round pick, but he just never seemed like a – like never got him being like a great player in the in college, but he ended up being a pretty darn good NFL player. Ryan yeah. Grant was also a better NFL player than he was. A Much player. better NFL player. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he definitely was. Um, Brock Wright? Other. Brock Wright's one? Brock Wright. But, that, yeah. but that's more so – yeah, that's correct, but that's more so just because he was buried so much. But that's sure. that factors into it. I mean, that yeah. factors into it. Um, I'm trying to think I mean, of, I of mean, because Brock Wright had like less than a hundred yards receiving in his career at Notre Dame, right? Something like that. Yeah, which yeah. is he had like, like two hundred something yards, yards in his touchdowns. Running against Bowling Green in 2019. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, but you know now he's like you see, and and you watch him like that one. What was that long catch and run he had late in the year? You're like, this dude is moving. And yeah, dude ran a four five nine at the his pro day, you know, yes. four six flat at his pro day. So the dude can run. There's no doubt about I, it. I, I think you mentioned one earlier, Brian. I would say Matthias, Matthias Farley had a better NFL yep. career than college. I mean, he was a good college player, but like he was pretty dang good at safety in the NFL for a couple of years, man. Yeah. yeah, he was. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of some other guys that that would have been in that uh in that mold, Ryan. You don't I usually mean, well, see it, right? Like you don't usually yeah. see that type of no one yeah. talked about JJ Jansen when he was at Notre Dame. I don't remember sure. anyone. The guys what 20 year NFL veteran now? It's a long snapper. Something like that. Right. Yeah. Like it's been around forever. Uh, yeah. So that's obviously pretty cool. Um, so it's funny, is like the only th thing I remember about people saying about JJ Jansen, well, he's only at Notre Dame because his dad's a big wealthy donor. And it's like, well, maybe, but all I know is that guy's going to have one of the longest NFL careers of any Notre Dame alum ever. Right. So you can say whatever you want, but that guy has perfected what he did at Notre Dame at the NFL level. And so I'd say that's an impressive one. I'm yeah. trying to think of some others, Ryan. I, you know, there, there aren't a whole lot of others. Romeo Okwara. That's another one. Yeah. Romeo yeah. had a really nice last year at Notre Dame. The thing that hurt Romeo was he was so young. He was 16 years old as a freshman at Notre Dame. Yeah. Just was nuts. But yeah, he, he would be one. He'd be another one that I would put in there. It's a good one. Yeah. I can't, I can't think of any other ones. That's, yeah, it's a good list. I remember Jonas. I remember Jonas Gray had one silly game for the Patriots. The NFL, just like two hundred yards, but they and just then they like show up late for something, and he got just, <laughs> never just saw like, him again. You had a chance, and then you did something. Oh my gosh, dude! Oh. He looked. I remember I I picked him up on fantasy after that week, Brian. I'm like, uh oh, here we go, Jonas. And then you never heard from him again, man. Never yep. heard from him again. Yeah, I'm trying. David Givens is a good one. That's definitely really a good, good one. one. Yeah, really good one. I'm trying to think of some others. 
But uh, yeah, that'd be the primary one. Well, okay, here's one. Uh, I mean, I could kind of cheat a little bit, right? And uh, sure. And, and say uh, Dorsey Levens. Okay. I mean, he he was he played another name, transferred he, to Georgia, Tech. Georgia Tech. Yeah, he was okay yeah. at Georgia Tech, but you know, I think he had a he had a uh, pretty memorable Notre Dame or uh, professional career. Won a Super yeah. Bowl with the Packers. He was good, with but college, yeah. yeah, I mean, his first year at Notre Dame, his four years in college, he ran for 132 yards at Notre Dame, 30, 53 yards at Notre Dame. Transferred to Georgia Tech, ran for 213 yards at Georgia Tech, set 823 yards in his last year at Georgia Tech, and. Uh, was a fifth round draft pick in the NFL and was a starter on the Super Bowl team. Yep. You know, so didn't have a long career because then he had some injuries. Yeah. But for a couple years there, it's pretty good. It was good. You know, had uh fourteen hundred yards the year that they won the Super Bowl. Next year only played half the year because of injuries and had a thousand yards the next year and then he was just never healthy again after that. But I'd say pretty memorable. Guy started in two Super Bowls and won one of them. It's pretty good, right? Yes, pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. Yeah. Here we go. Next question is from David Lowe. He said, just curious, is NC State going to be any good next year? Could they that be a trap game? I think it could be. I mean, David, I, don't, this- I don't think it can be a trap game because of where it's being. Uh, to me, trap game is very clearly defined as a game that has to be to me, some level of trap, meaning it's like it's surrounded by something else that can distract you from it. Because you have one game between that and Ohio State. Yeah, because right? you, you, play, you play Tennessee State and Central Michigan around, around NC that. State. Good point. Good point. Now, yeah. could NC State beat Notre Dame? Yes, absolutely. They are capable yeah. of if Notre Dame doesn't play well. they To your point, Ryan, they should be a good football team. They bring in Robert and I as their offensive coordinator. That should help. Yep. They bringing in Brennan Armstrong should help them because we know he can run Robert and I's offense and they are pretty deep a quarterback, to be honest with you. I mean, if all those guys stay, they have some pretty good defense. I mean, lose some good players, but bring back some good players. Yep. Yeah, that's a that's a now should Notre Dame beat them? Yes, they should. Yep. But if Notre Dame doesn't play well, can NC State beat them? Absolutely. They can. Yeah, they so, still they saw some dudes on defense, especially, yes. man. Like they got a couple guys. So I yeah. just don't view that as a trap game. Just because a team can beat you doesn't make it a trap game. The trap game to me is like Duke is a trap game. Why? They play right after they play Ohio State. So Notre Dame's going to be on some sort of emotional feeling no matter what. Either they're going to be off this great high of beating Ohio State or this really rejected our season might be over like they did this past year against Marshall. That was a different team that played against Marshall than the one against Ohio State. Right. And, you know, um, that that's a trap game. NC State's not a trap game to me. If anything, that's the first big game that you're looking forward to. So that's the way I would look at that one. So, um, yeah, that's why I wouldn't call it a trap game, Ryan. But is NC State going to be good? Yes. Could they beat Notre Dame? Sure. They, they're they capable of it. Yeah. Should they beat Notre Dame? No. They shouldn't beat Notre Dame. But they could. Okay. They could. So uh, I, I'm going to bring up a stat here in a little bit, Ryan, that, that a question reminded me of that. So let's go yeah. to uh, Gavin Harden while I'm looking this up. His question is, Ryan, is there any buzz around Audrey Gessler or Logan Diggs when it comes to NFL draft circles for next year? Yeah, Gavin, there is. There is. I, I actually have had uh, I've actually had agents ask me about both players in the past. And I I you know I, I don't know how much I'm supposed to disclose in this, but I have had a scout that talked to me a little bit about, you know, just my opinions on Audrick specifically for next year. So I've had agents ask about both. I've had a scout ask my opinion on one already and Obviously, they were both just sophomores this year, so they weren't draft eligible into the 2024 NFL draft cycle. So, yes, there is some buzz. I'll have more information as far as after the spring when scouts are going through and they do the Blesso NFS reports as far as, like, who they're really looking at and maybe more of an early round projection and just kind of feel that way. But, yes, there are, I've had agents ask me about both, and I have had a scout already ask me about Archie guest today. So, yes, they do have some buzz. All right, let's go to this next one here. Question is for from Zaremba R. Brian, the other day when you and Ryan went conference by conference for teams, you would hypothetically root for you. Did you didn't mention Virginia or Virginia Tech? I know you're a Virginia guy, so any reason for that? Yeah, so I grew up in Ohio. I was actually born in Ohio and lived there till I was about 15. 
So my love for Virginia didn't come until I was older. And I do it for fun. You know, it's where my family still lives and all that. But I mean, I lived in Ohio longer than I lived in Virginia for my for my life. So that's partly why. And so when I was a kid, I was growing up in Ohio. So when I was a kid and all these feelings that I had, like, you know, when I was outside shooting and pretending I was Adrian Autry or or Ramil Robinson, I was in Ohio. I was a kid in Ohio, growing up in Ohio. I wasn't in Virginia. Virginia had some decent basketball teams back then. They had the really good Ralph Sampson team, which was before I was really old enough to really remember. I mean, out Ralph Sampson played against the Celtics and what the 86 finals, right? I was eight, you know, and I remember those fine. So I remember Ralph Sampson more as an NBA player, just like Hakeem Olajuwon. I remember Hakeem Olajuwon as a great player for the Rockets. I don't remember him with the Houston Cougars. So uh, that's why. And so Virginia didn't really have any guys that were like that for me. I just wasn't really a team that attracted. And Virginia Tech was like nothing when I was a kid. Like no, nobody knew anything about Virginia Tech when I was a kid. UVA was the only team that really anybody had any feelings for. Now I did really like Virginia's football team in '88 to like '89 to '90 because I was a big fan of Sean Moore as a quarterback. I really enjoy. I hated those white helmets with the blue and orange stripes. It's kind of weird looking. I don't like white helmets without some kind of uh, logo on it. So I hate Penn State uniforms. They're the, the dullest uniforms like just ever. <laughs> but uh you know it's just my personal opinion but i just saw just virginia tech was never a thing so when i by the time virginia tech got good at football i was a teenager slash adult you know it's like yeah michael vick was kind of the breakout i was running in college when michael vick was a freshman like I, michael vick was a year behind me him and ronald curry were juniors when i was a senior and i've sold this story before right i thought i was a really good high school quarterback until i went and watched ronald curry play in person and i was like <laughs> yeah i'm not that good <laughs> Dude, he was a freak show, man. He, he was. was a freak show. He was. He didn't play wide receiver in the NFL, man. He would have yeah. been better if he didn't get injured. Like, he's yeah. If, good he, if, it, if he did not go to North Carolina to play, if he would have gone to a football school, he would have had a much different career. I will yeah. take that to my grave, man. There's no doubt. So I wanted to bring something up real quick, Ryan. Here's a here's okay. a very fascinating thing for you okay. to to look at, right? So right now, Sam Hartman coming into the season has 12,967 career passing yards. Yep. So if Sam Hartman goes out there this year and simply pat, so he ranks right now 19th all time in career passing yards. If he just throws for 3,500 yards, which is just an okay, case, it's a good season. It's not lights out. It's, it's, it's a good season. It's a, I mean, it's honestly, it's not that much more than what Jack Cohn threw for, and Jack Cohn missed time at Notre Dame. You know, missed half of a game when he got benched, missed other time with an injury. You know, but Jack Cohn in 2021 threw for 3,150 3, yards. Uh, Ian Book in 2019 threw for 3,040 3, yards. So let's just, just, let's just do this, actually, Ryan. Let's just say he matches what Jack Cohn did, which I would be disappointed by. Yeah. He matches what Jack Cohn did. Let me pull it up here. I just went away from that page here real quick. If he does, if he does that, I hate it when you you go to, go away from a page. He would then rank all time in college football as the number four all time leading passer. Number four. If he simply throws thirty touchdowns, just thirty, which is again not that big of a deal, he yeah. would then rank third all time in college football history. If he wow, just man. throws as many as Jack Cohn threw, which of 25, he would rank third all time in college football history. So it, you're going to see Sam Hartman breaking a lot, or passing a lot of people on the all time passer list. He's he has a chance to end his career as a top five all time passer in college football history, yards and touchdowns. Now again, the COVID year helps, but it, it's going to be a fun year for that kind of stuff, man. It just and that somebody had made a comment about that. The, somebody made a comment about Hartman that made me think of that. Gotcha. Here's another thing. Anthony Kulik says, I would argue that Harrison Smith's career was better in the NFL than at Notre Dame. I would somewhat agree with that, but I don't think – here's the thing. I think his perception of how good he is is better in the NFL. I thought Harrison Smith was an incredibly underrated player for Notre Dame his last two years. Man. In 2010 and 2011, Harrison Smith was an excellent player. Notre Dame fan, here's what y'all, here's what y'all got to remember about yourselves, and and I'm and I'm the same way to a degree, but we have two fans in general 
we don't forgive and we don't forget. And we watched Harrison Smith stink as basically a rover in that de- the way that they used it, which was just it was a lot of, it was a linebacker, and he was not a natural player there, and he did not play well. And that's what a lot of Notre Dame fans just always remember about him. And so when he moved to safety in 2010 and 2011, people had already have already cemented their opinion of him, and they weren't going to change no matter the fact he had seven interceptions in 2010, including a game winning interception against USC, three picks against Miami. And so no matter what he did, people just were not going to change their opinion of Harrison Smith. Just weren't going to do it. I loved Harrison Smith. He was so good in 2010 and 2011. Yes. So good. He was an excellent player those two years. And so I I think he he was – I'm not shocked that Harrison Smith's having the career that he had. I think the perception is what changed. I don't think Harrison had necessarily a better career. I mean, Harrison Smith, his last two years, his, in 2010, Ryan, he had 91 tackles, seven interceptions, seven pass breakups. In 2011, he had 90 tackles, no interceptions, but he had three three tackles for loss and 10 pass breakups. And part of the reason he didn't have any interceptions in 2011 is nobody threw at him really that much. <laughs> Because of how they watched what he did against Utah. I mean, the pick he had against Utah. Go back and watch the. I was at that game, and he was in a. He was chasing a drag, and when the ball was thrown, like here's the receiver coming on the drag. Ball's that way. Harrison's over top this way, and as soon as the ball, like Harrison baited the quarterback, he was in trail position. And as soon as the ball left the quarterback's hands, he went whoop, stepped right in front, and picked it. It was one of the most freaky athletic plays I've ever seen. Yep, and you know. One of his picks, a couple of his picks against Miami were good. The other was just like quarterback just was so awful. But he was a stud at Notre Dame. He, he was. was a stud. So once he moved to safety, he was a stud. Yeah. I just don't think the perception was that he wasn't – he wasn't perceived to be a stud at Notre Dame for a number of reasons. His including last the years, fact man. That, right. Including the fact that he just didn't look good as a linebacker. You know, so I think that's part of it as well. So, yeah, that's a a, a good comment. But he has had a very good NFL career. Harrison Smith played like an All-American his last two years in Notre Dame. He just got no um, All-American love at all because the perception wasn't there for him. And they – yeah, so. How how you can can have 90-plus tackles and seven interceptions in a season and not make an All-American list is just beyond – In fairness, three of those picks came in the bowl game against – Miami. So the all American list had already been kind of decided, but still like 90 tackles and four interceptions and seven pass breakups for a safety. It's pretty good. 90 <laughs> tackles and 10, 10 pass breakups. Like he had in 2011. It's pretty flipping good. And three tackles. And, for loss, and, pretty good. and he should, and he should have had some notoriety following that 2010 season as well too. Right. Where it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah probably. Cause we know a lot of those lists yeah. are very uh, reputation driven. You know what I mean? So. Yep. yep. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it, uh, <laughs> yeah, Harrison Smith was a dude. So I'm just going to leave it at that one. All right, let's get to Mark Stewart. Here we go. Mark's question, how important do you think it is that Notre Dame starts to have high draft picks consistently to help recruiting? Very uh, important. Yeah, fair. I mean, why does Notre Dame recruit tight end and offensive line the way that they do right now? It's not because – they know that Harry Easton's a great coach. How do they know that Harry Easton's a great coach? Because he puts guys in the NFL on the high level. That's yes. that's how kids perceive a guy being a great coach. Yep. Right. I mean, fair. I mean, not every coach that produces big time recruits is necessarily a great coach. He just re- is really good at recruiting really, really good players. And, you know, they have a lot of God given ability, but it's, man, NFL, Notre Dame starting tight end has been an NFL draft pick going back to like since 1998. The guy that starts yeah. the season as a starter gets drafted when his career's over going all the way back to, I think, I think Jabari Holloway the year before Jabari Holloway might've been the last time that was, I think Gary Godsey might've been the last guy that that happened with or I, something like, I mean, it's just I, been a long I, long I, time. I, I love that left tackle stat at Notre Dame, Brian. It was like, since Zach Martin took over as a left tackle for Notre Dame, all the way up until Liam Eikenberg, they were all first round picks, you know, yeah. within that time frame. It was just like, yeah. that's pretty good, man. It's not yeah. bad, you know? And that streak is still alive because technically, Blake Fisher started the 2021 season at left tackle. 
Well, Liam, Liam went in the second round, though, so it ended there. Well, I thought he said yeah. first, first or second round pick. Well, I mean, yeah, if you stretch it to two rounds, and that's yeah. definitely intact. But every sure. single guy, you're, you, the one you're talking about, the first round picks, yes. Yeah. But I was like, what, yeah. three guys? Yeah, it was my, Zach my and then Ronnie. They, and, yeah. Every single one's been a high draft pick. Very high. Liam was like, what, 42? He was 10 spots out of the first round. First or second round pick. Blake will probably continue that. And then, of course, Joe will continue that. And then, yes. I mean, that's – but that's why. And why are they struggling to recruit some other positions? Okay. I mean, when was the last time they were put a well. quarterback in the first round of the NFL draft? Literally, right. Ryan, you were a, a like what freshman in high school? 06, 07 uh, draft. Yeah, 06. I was a freshman. Yep. So yeah. yeah, it's been a minute. Yeah. It's been a minute. Here's a I'm gonna I'm gonna read this, Ryan. Okay. It's a four-part question from Edward Cheatham. Okay. This reminds me, I had a friend in high school named Cam Watley, uh-huh. and he would always bring up these really ridiculous, <laughs> would you rather this or this scenario? Hypotheticals, yeah. And it's yeah. like, neither, dude. What are you, nuts? <laughs> but so Edward has a really interesting one that reminds me of that. And so he says, okay, okay hypothetical for the whole IB staff. And so for today, Ryan, it's going to be me and you. Okay. You have two head football coach job offers to start a school's program from scratch. Okay. Offer one. Styers University, which is a team full of football geniuses. We're talking nerds of the sport, but they all show a staggering lack of athleticism. <laughs> okay. Offer two to Dario Tech, which is full of dudes. We're talking athletes, but they're all fencers, swimmers, etc., and have a disturbingly low football acumen, no mm-hmm. field awareness whatsoever. You have two seasons to win 50% of your games or you're fired. Assuming you can't recruit your way out of either situation, which do you take? So do you take the guys that have the great football minds but can't run or the guys that can't think their way out of a wet paper bag but can really, really run? I I love the question, Edward. It's very creative. Yes. I would, I would choose the greatest to... questions we've ever had. I, I don't, I don't I think it's – Oh, it's an easy one for me. I'm picking the Dario Tech because in college football, if you got dudes, man, you can still win some football games. Like that's just all it comes the down thing to. That, yeah. that got me on it, Ryan, is you have to win 50% of your games. Yes. I can win 50% of my games with a bunch of, of freaky athletes. Because he put dudes in all caps, right? Yep. Now I'll never win a championship that way. Yeah. But here's the reality. If I have a bunch of unathletic, really smart kids, I'm still going to stink. I just am. Because you 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 just are. Now, you're you're you know, you know who you know who this and you know who this is. You know who Dario Tech was? There's Notre Dame in 2008-2009. Poorly coached team, not a lot of great football acumen. They were still over 500, game over 500. Why? Cuz they had dudes. They could just out athlete certain people. Yeah. You know, I mean just simple as that. And the reality is, is if, if I'm starting from scratch and I've got a bunch of guys that, that aren't athletic, I mean, imagine if Harvard had to play in the SEC. Right, right, right. Yeah. Going 12, yeah. right? So, uh, yeah, I, I'd go with the Dario Tech. That's a – Ryan, that was one of my favorite – I've been – like that's a real. I was curious where you were going to go with that. I oh. actually kind of thought we were going to go with the other the other direction. Why? Because I wear know? glasses. Because I'm a nerd. Yeah. Just yeah. kidding. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, I almost me, I, Ryan, I discriminate I, against people that wear glasses. I, I was trying to pick the other one just because I want to pick Styers instead of Dario, but that's a yeah. different conversation for a different that's day. Mean. <laughs> You've kicked Vince enough today. <laughs> he's not in the chat anymore. I don't think so. He's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, let's get to some more as we wrap these things up. Here's one from D Hawk. D Hawk's question: Do you guys believe Tyler Buckner will be the clear leader for quarterback one in 2024? I think many fans are overlooking his talent just because of no, what Notre Dame has coming in with Kenny Minchie and CJ Carr. Yes, I do think he'd be the clear leader in 2024. As of right yep. now, do mm-hmm. I think it's a 100% guarantee? No, probably not because those other two goods that guys are really good. But I I think Tyler Buckner is extremely gifted. I do. I just think he missed a lot of very important development time. I was talking with somebody about this earlier today. Somebody texted me when, when they saw my tweet about how Tyler looked today. 
I was like, you know, like people don't realize how talented Tyler is. He's yeah. really talented. Yeah, he had a couple bad games last year, but he's really talented. And um, yeah, he's going to be hard to beat out. And he's he's not going to be easy for Sam Hartman to beat out, but I fully expect him to do it because Sam Hartman's very good. But Tyler Buckner, if he if if Tyler, here's the thing: the only person that's going to stop Tyler from being a, a really good college quarterback is Tyler. That's it. And I mean that twofold: one is injury, which he can't really control, or B, he just he makes decisions that are unwise, has doesn't have the right attitude or whatever. And that's true for all kids. You all, y'all, look, man, adversity teaches us so much more than success, in my opinion. I fully believe that. Yep. And adversity defines our character so much more than success. It's easy. You ever like see a kid growing up that just like, you know, playing ball and he's just like football and everybody else. And he just talks a lot of trash and he's in, and then he plays that one guy that's his size yes. and he gets beat and he just handles it awful. Starts yep. blowing the ball, crying. Like, you know, yeah, you thought you were hot stuff until, you know, somebody, you know, puts you in your place and now you can't handle it. To me, it's, it's, I want the guy that's out there on the court and he loses two or three games. He doesn't like it. So he goes home and says, I'm going to work my butt off and may, and, and do whatever I need to do to make sure I never lose again. That's the guy that I want. I don't want the guy that, oh, things didn't work out for me my freshman year, so I'm going to pout and go home and take my ball and go somewhere else to some other coach who's promising me something. All right, cool, man. I wasn't going to win with you anyway. I, I really wasn't. So if Tyler has the right attitude and can stay healthy, he's got a chance to be a great quarterback in college, in my opinion. He does. Yep. I don't know if it'll be 2023. But I definitely gonna be 2024. 20, and as much as I love Kenny Minchin and CJ Carr, I just don't see them beating him out in 24. I just don't. Yeah. It'll be tough. But because if Tyler he gets will be hurt, four years in, yeah. Like, if he yeah. gets hurt and has to miss a significant period of time, he won't get his job back. Sure. That that's the thing. But that's I a agree. great place to be as a football program. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, as as long as he can stay healthy going into 2024, if he kind of buys into everything, he'll be a fourth year player. He'll be in two years under Jared Parker's system. He'll be obviously a second year now going into working with Gino Gadouli as his quarterback coach. A lot of good, obviously, there from a baseline perspective. So it's up to Tyler, man. He's still got a lot in front of him. Like it's not 2023 or bust for Tyler Buckner. He still has a lot of opportunities in the future. It's just about buying in right now for me. Yep. Absolutely. Just got to be careful you don't get Wally pipped. And that's true. Yes. That's true for a lot of guys. You know, yep. it's true for a lot of guys. All right, here we go, Ryan. From Andrew Van, is there any chance we see Blake Fisher get work at guard? I still believe he could be an elite guard. I don't think so. I mean, yeah, I don't think so. You know, Tosh would have to be really good to force that move. And I just, yeah, I, I, well, I, I, I agree with you though, Andrew. I agree that he could be an elite guard. I, I really do. I just don't think that's what he's going to want to do. I don't yeah. think Blake is going to, want to make that move. I don't think Notre Dame is going to make that. And they're not even willing to move Clarence Lewis to safety. That's the biggest no-brainer position move on the planet. And they're not even willing to do that. I don't think they'd be willing to move Blake Fisher away from and, tackle. And Blake came in at 310 this spring, right? So, like, obviously he's reshaping his body to be a better offensive tackle, right? Like, that's kind he's of where we are. Space, so. yeah. Exactly. So, I, I – I, I think that that ship has kind of sailed. I would have loved to see it. I mean, I was on that that yeah. wavelength last year of like, oh, if Tosh Baker could be a guy, and then you move him inside a guard. Like, mm -hmm. but at this point, I just think he's going to be the right tackle at Notre Dame this year. And then after that, I wouldn't be shocked if Joe Walt leaves and he stays if he's the left tackle at Notre yep. Dame. Like that's just like kind of what he did when Stanley left, and and Eichenberg actually did that too because Liam played a lot of right tackle early in his career, you know, yep. and. uh so, yeah, um, Ronnie Stanley did that, too. Remember, he started a right tackle in 23rd. People forget that Zach Martin and Ronnie Stanley started together for a season. Wild, People forget man. that. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. Man. You know, Ronnie Stanley, Mike McGlinchey, and Quentin Nelson were all in the same Notre Dame offensive line in college. It's ridiculous. Here we go. Peter Dagon, 55. And Peter Dagon says, interested to know what you think about linebacker position this year. I think it'll be Prince Kali. J.D. Bertrand and Jack Kaiser as the starters. It's possible. I just – I don't know. I, I haven't seen Prince take a jump yet, and that's my thing. I just haven't yeah. seen him take a jump yet. And he's really a lot shorter and smaller than I anticipated. So Yeah, I, I think that you have two out of three for me, Peter Degan. I think that it's going to be – at least the start of the season, I think it's going to be Bertrand, Kaiser, and – 
probably be Maris at will, and then hopefully I Nolan hope kind of unseats him at some point. Like that's yeah. just kind of how I see it. But yeah, I hope it's. I hope. I hope that it's. I'd be okay with Kaiser moving to Will and Jalen Sneed starting at Rover or Ziegler at Will and yeah. Kaiser slash like uh, yeah Kaiser slash Sneed at Rover. I'd be very comfortable with that. Last couple questions here, Ryan. Here's one from Mark Avalone. Mark says, "Do you think some teams overuse helmets uh, stickers, aka Ohio State? Seems like by midseason, half of the team has helmets full." I'm old school. I love helmet stickers. I love it too, man. I, now I, I think you you can't be obnoxious with it, like you know, where every little thing, you know, like oh, you went to class, you get a helmet sticker. No, it's got to be about football achievement. I'm sorry, it just it does. Yeah. I think also all the stickers should be uniform as well, right? You don't have like eight different stickers. I'm a big fan. To me, uh, like with what Florida State used to do with the tomahawks, with what Ohio State does with the Buckeyes, I love that stuff. I think that's great because that's just kind of how when I was a kid, that's just what I mean, that's what football did. You had I mean helmet stickers was a big thing when I was growing up. It's not as much anymore. But yeah, I, I think that's a really cool thing. We used I, to I, have we used to have uh we were the uh, my high school team was the Wildcats, Brian. So we used to get the helmet stickers with like little paw paws on them. Mm-hmm. Um I remember we had this one stud defensive end. He was a year older than me. He hated them though, so he would give them away to our one starting corner that was not good at all, and he would just like have so many. It's like everyone thought he was a stud when the game started. They're like, "Oh, he's not actually a stud." <laughs> yeah, fantastic. No, he's, not. Um, he's not. Yeah, I I do. Now, here's the only thing I I would be my caveat is you have to have some uniformity to how they're applied. Like I don't want guys like put like the no, a number or a logo so, like so, like using the stickers to create some sort of thing like you yeah. know fill up the line fill up the line fill, you know what I mean like or go across go across you know there's got to be some uniformity I don't want I don't like stickers when like you get those kids that will, like make like little symbols out of their stickers I don't like that you know like have some uniformity hey it goes across the bottom and then works its way up or starts you know works from here and works its way back whatever I don't care. But those are I like I like the I think that's cool that Ohio State does that. Do, they still okay. do that, right? Yeah, I think they, they still, still do that. Do. Right? That's what yeah. I thought. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I think that's really cool. I, yeah. I'm I think they should definitely. I'm not, like getting visions of uh, AJ Hawk. I remember his was all full constantly, man. Like, yeah, yeah, he was a good yes. player, man. <laughs> yes, he was. He was. I'm trying to. I'm actually going to pull up the uh, bowl game really quick because now that I think about it, I don't. I don't remember. I don't remember um, the the Georgia game. I'm trying to go look and see, um, look at some things from that game. Yeah, okay. CJ Stroud, they had helmet stickers. I just like I don't remember CJ Stroud like having helmet stickers in that game for some crazy reason. So, yeah, they, they can't to, get rid of that man. That's that is one of the cool things. Ohio I could State be completely does. wrong. It's like I literally don't remember it. I'm not saying it didn't yeah. happen. I'm just saying like I don't remember it. So I'm gonna go pull this up here real quick. Oh man, we haven't seen Archer all show, Brian. The minute you start talking about Ohio State, he's yeah. in the chat. Oh, he's now. in there. Stop he's in there. Yeah, of course he is. Of course he is. Of course he is. As soon as we say something like that, he's all up in there. I'm looking at some other players uh in that as well, Ryan. And yeah, they they had helmet stickers on there. I'm trying to find one with CJ with his helmet on. But there we go. Yeah, he had helmet stickers all over. I guess he had so many on there, it just looked like his helmet was one looked color. Looked natural. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> he had so Seriously. many on there. Like, how does a guy that throws as many touchdowns as he have have room for all those stickers? Seriously. So that's the other thing, too, man. But, yeah, like, that's something Penn State missed out on to me. Penn State helmets would look a lot cooler if they had, like, little blue, like, paws. Nittany Line logos or paws. Or but I like, yeah. like the little pins. Because I think the, the the Penn State logo is really conducive to a sticker. Yeah. You know, just, like, you know, just put them bad boys on there. That'd be really cool. Yeah, I agree. That'd be really cool. Yep, that'd be I, I I like those. I think team that who else who else does that in college football? You said Florida State. State, does Florida um, State still does it, I believe. I believe so, who, yeah. Who, I'm gonna type who let me see this. College football, who does helmet stickers? Let me see this. College football. Let's see here. This is Google is a cool thing sometimes. Who <laughs> does helmet stickers? Let's see if there's still teams that uh you can't think uh, of anybody else aside from those teams. Yeah. So let's see here. Um, looks like they say Clemson does it. Clemson does it really? Yeah, they uh, do a paw print. Huh? Um, 
Eastern Michigan, Florida International, Florida State, Louisiana Lafayette, Michigan Wolverines. I knew Michigan did. That's right. North Carolina, Northern Illinois, Ohio State, Pitt, Stanford, UNLV, and UTEP. I don't remember Stanford guys doing it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting. So, see, I don't what, even notice it. What would Stanford even use? Would it, be a... uh, it was an axe. An axe. Oh, okay. an axe blade, which is kind of awful. And, and if you really think about it, that's kind of morbid. Yes. Your mascot's a tree. Yes. And your reward sticker's You're gonna chop it down. an axe blade. <laughs> what the heck kind of crap is that? I you know, no like, what are you guys doing here? So, yeah, that's a little weird. A little bit. I'm not gonna lie to you. That's a little weird. That's really, really weird. But hey, Explain, it explains the, explains yeah. the downfall of Stanford. Stanford right guys have helmets. I see it now. They have. They have. Yeah, they're Stanford guys with with stickers on their helmets. Hmm. Yeah, never noticed that. Notre Dame lost that game because Ed, because Ed Orgeron was at it. That's why they lost that game. He was at that game. You remember that? Yeah. Was, oh, is he going to be? On, is he going to be on the staff? Mm -hmm. He's going to be the defensive line coach. Yeah. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. All right, last uh, last one here, Ryan. I, I wanted to okay. save the best one for last. Here we go. It's from David Lowe. David Lowe says, do y'all think ESPN's comparison of Braylon James to Golden Tate is accurate? So first of all, David, are you are you still here? Where did they write this? If yeah, I need, I, need here, I need an article link. Where did they this, write man? this? Because I have to know the answer to this that question might, because that, that might be the worst comparison I've ever seen in my life. It's That's in really the conversation. Really it is. It's, really it's one, in man. the conversation for one of the worst, Ryan. That is. So just... we're, we're talking about a six, three outside receiver with legit deep speed, little bit of a, a lanky build, right? Compared it to a inside out physical after the catch five eleven wide receiver, like golden Tate, who was a running back in high school. Right. That's that's what we're comparing right now. That's that's what we're doing. Yeah, that was the dumbest thing I've heard in a long time. But I, yeah. I got to know where they said that. I have yeah. to know where they said that because I like it's not that I don't believe you, but it's like I just find that shocking. Oh, oh I believe him. It's just because it's ESPN. I believe him 100. percent But it's yeah, it's bad. That's just a terrible, terrible. I would really like to know where they wrote that. Really would like to know that. They don't have the same body type. They're not the same play style. Like there's just nothing that is reminiscent of one yeah. another at I'd all. I'd really like to know the answer to that because that just seems ridiculously stupid. Yes. In my opinion, it really does. It really, yeah. Somebody said Georgia does it too. Yeah. Georgia does it. They do those white little bones on there. So I've yeah. got about the bones. Good yeah, call. They do that. That's another good yeah. one. Jonathan Fink had that one. Yeah. Georgia, nice. Georgia does that. That's a good one. That's a really good one. Yeah. That's a terrible comparison. Awful. I mean, like you said, 5'10", built like a running back, thick legs. Yak guy. Great like, after the catch. Yeah. Could stretch the field. Sure, that's the only thing they have in common. They could stretch the field. But if you want to but compare even, them Even to a, that, they stretch completely differently. Like, yeah. they're not the same type of stretching. <laughs> okay. Uh, some Ebenezer Gatsby said that ESPN compared him to Will Fuller, not Golden Tate. Now, that I could buy. I don't Still think he's as better. explosive yeah. as Will. A very similar game to Will. You know what I mean? Vertical guy down the Vertical field manage. using your speed over top. Yep. That I could do. So Ebenezer, if that was actually what they did, then I could buy that. That's why I said, Ryan, I just have a hard time that they're that stupid. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's a terrible comparison, Golden Tate. Yep. Will Fuller, different, a little different body type. Braylon's a little taller, a little a lot thicker. Right. But Style of play wise, yeah, Wolf Fuller was a downfield vertical weapon that could do some stuff after the catch using his speed, and that's what Braylon was in high school. So that I could buy. That I could buy. Uh, Braylon was a little faster than Will coming out of high school, but Will took a big jump when he got to college. If, if I'll tell you this, if Braylon James makes a similar jump in speed that Will Fuller made, we're going to have a lot of fun. He's, he's going to be years. running a 4 2 soon, man. That's, <laughs> right. that's absolutely right. So that's a lot more believable. Yeah, and a lot more fair. Uh, that one I could buy, Ryan. That one I could buy. So yeah, yeah, a little yeah. better. Still not great, but a little better for sure. Well, what for what sure. what what's not? I'm just curious. I'm not arguing. I'm just curious. What's not great it's, about it? it? It's just the heights attributes, the length mm -hmm. attributes. Like I just I just think that Braylon's going to win down the field a little differently than what Will Fuller was yeah. winning. That's just it. Yeah, possibly slight yeah. difference, but it's similar. It's yeah. similar. 
So yeah, I think, but I think uh, if you're talking Notre Dame players, I think the guy that would probably compare the best body type, he's a little bigger version of Bra- Chris Brown, and probably the closest Notre Dame guy to him, in my opinion, because he's a little thicker than Chris was, taller than Chris was, but both raw, vertical guys coming out. Will was on a different gear, man. I mean, in college, Will was at a completely, completely different gear than what Braylon played at. Chris Brown is much more similar to what Will, what Braylon James could be uh, a style of play. So I just think Braylon's a little bit more of a natural football player uh, than Chris. Chris was a track guy, you know, uh, but yeah, that's what I would say. And I think Braylon's str- a lot. Sh- here's the, here's the big difference. And this is going to matter. Braylon is a lot stronger than Chris Brown was coming out of high school. But game-wise, Ryan, similar way you could use him in a game. Will Fuller just had a different gear man, than just anybody, in my opinion. It, but they both – one thing I have in common, they both have inconsistent hands. Like Chris had – or uh, Will had a little inconsistent hands, and Braylon has had a little bit of that at times as well. So just got to get a little bit more comfortable snatching the ball with ease. So, yeah, that's a good one. Hey, folks, that's going to do it for us today. Hit that like button, everybody. Please do us that favor. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification bell. These things help us out. So, pe- Why do we ask you to do that? Because those things help. Uh, I don't can't explain to you from the standpoint of how the algorithm works. I just know that the algorithm says that that's the way it works. The more engagement we have, the more likes we have, the more shares we have, the more comments we have. It just it lets people know this is a channel that people need to watch. And so people that are looking to get Notre Dame content uh, or that way. It's also why we ask you to do five star reviews on the podcast, because if we're getting five star reviews and the more five star reviews we get, the more that people see, hey, this is a channel that needs to be promoted more. And it helps us continue to grow that way. So, you know, people are always say, hey, look, I want to support you financially. Best way to do that. Sign up for the message board at boards.irishbreakdown.com. If you want to support us financially, but you're not in a place right now, and I get it, times are tough uh, for some people, and you still want to support us, those are the things you can do. Read all of our articles. So sign up for the mail, the the daily, the the um, the, the daily. Uh, <laughs> we have a mailer that goes out every day. A newsletter. A newsletter. A newsletter. A newsletter that goes out every day. Uh, I kept wanting to say mailer light, but that's the name of the thing that I use. So I kept wanting to say we have a mailer light that goes out, but that's the thing that we use. Um, but uh, we send a daily newsletter out, gets all of our free content. So read all of our free stories. That helps us make money. Hitting like on the show, sharing the podcast, giving us a five-star review. Those are all ways you can help Irish Breakdown. If, you, if you're if you a member of our site, Notre Dame fan or, fan or not. And hey, look, you can join the message board if you're not a Notre Dame fan, if you're willing to talk ball and not get into you know insults and things. If you want to talk ball, Come on in, Frank McCatry, Archer. Come on over. Just know that you know we're Notre Dame board, so we're going to want to talk about Notre Dame. But you know, as long as you're there, respectful. Most ninety five percent of the people will treat you with great respect, just like they do in this chat. So you can come on over too, and uh, we'd love to have you. So those are the different things you can do. So hey, we're going to be back Monday. Ryan, you and Sean will be back. You guys are going to review this week all this weekend's visitors. So from now until Monday, Ryan is going to be doing nothing but eating, sleeping, and talking to recruits about how things are going this weekend. And uh, okay, maybe a couple of things. You do have a one-year-old, so you know you have to do some of that parenting thing. But other than that, he's going to be talking to recruits. Uh, so at 2 o'clock on Monday, Ryan and Sean Davis will get together and talk about this weekend's recruiting opportunities. We just got a text from Sean about Justin Scott, so we'll read that here when the show is over. And uh, so they'll be back on Monday. And then, of course, Ryan will be back on Tuesday. So y'all have a phenomenal rest of your week. I hope to see you guys on the message boards uh, talking about the practice report that's up today and some of the other stuff that we'll have up there. Thanks, everybody. Have an awesome day, and we'll talk to you again soon on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.